Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to go, but I've got uh, I got a lot of fear. I, you know, I'm just not used. To, I'm used to living in a big house, and I'm not used to traveling, and it's it's a big leap for me. But she said I'll go with you, and then she went. The first leg was from Cincinnati to Indianapolis. So we get to Indianapolis, we do the gathering, and she comes to me and she goes, "I am so sorry, and I know I shouldn't say this, but she said I left my pillow." Uh, you know how Linus, you know, and and has the blanket. She said, "I am not going to be able to make this tour with you," and I left my pillow. It was snowy, it was ice cold, it was blizzard conditions. We'd just driven like three hours. Normally, it takes a couple hours, but three hours because of the conditions. And and I said, "Well, let me pray." And I said, "Jesus is saying, uh, don't don't look back." And she's like. Oh, I oh, I cannot do this tour uh, without that pillow. I said, well, I'll be here. And she said, we were driving in a van. We had a, a green van. So she took the van, and she headed back at night by herself in blizzard conditions. And she was driving back and on the interstate highway, and she fell asleep at the wheel, and she f completely fell asleep at the wheel, and then the car, the van started to just drift off to the side towards the, the fields, probably was headed over to just drift over and tumble, but there was Jesus with a semi-truck, she's falling asleep, the van losing control, she's, it's moving over there, Jesus comes and brings a big, giant semi-truck in the lane to her right, as she's drifting off, and she, wham, she's smashes in on the side to the semi-truck, which wakes her up. She grabs the wheel, and then she was like, what's, what's going on? And, and the, the guy stopped, and he's like, what are you doing out here on the road like this, you know, in the middle of the, the night, and where, where are you going? And she's like, oh, my God, thank you. Wait, you, don't, you don't know. You, I think you, you, like, saved my life or something. She said, I fell asleep, and I hit you the side. And then, so she gets back to Cincinnati. She calls me up. She said, oh, David, I, I know this is my own resistance, but I, I just, I said, well, how is it? The van's okay? To, she said, well, the van, it's all scraped up on the side, and the rear view mirror has been ripped off. But the only thing I heard was, don't go back, which really what Jesus is saying is we, the only way we can do is go forward with the miracles, really, you know, remember the Bible, don't turn back or you turn into a pillar of salt, you know, Lot's wife. I mean, there's a lot of symbology about don't look, don't look in the rearview mirror, don't go back. So she goes, she said, David, I'm going to catch up with it. We'll continue on the tour. I'm just going to go. I found a shop. So they, were repla they replaced the rearview mirror. It was all scraped up on the, along the side where it hit the semi-truck, but that saved her life. And then she comes there, and we do the gathering. I say, okay, we got a lot more to do here. We're heading out to the Midwest, the Plain States. And then we're driving out towards the highway. And um, I just had this strong feeling to pull over, take a turn, take another turn. And I stopped, and, and I said, I don't know. We're supposed to go into this building before we get on the highway. She's like, what, what is it? We walked in. It was an art gallery. And in the art gallery were all these pla paintings all around, and every single painting in the whole art gallery had two vehicles, a truck on the right and a vehicle, uh, a vehicle on the left, the whole gallery. And I just said, oh, well, look at this, Resta. And she just, and we both just walked through the whole gallery. That was the only thing on all the paintings. It was the same motif in everything. But it was like so indelible, like for her, you know, she's just channeled all this music from the angels and she, she knew who she was and all these past lives, you know, regressions. And I would say, well, this is the lifetime where we end, <laughs> end, end all the lifetimes. But that was like the key thing. It was like Jesus really wanted to imprint upon her mind. Because even that, even to stop, to go, turn, turn, to go into this, I didn't know it was an art gallery. It didn't look like an art gallery. It looked like just a, a regular door. But we opened it up, and we both were, <gasps> so it's just these signs and symbols you get that are so direct, like you can't miss it. Like if you really, if you really give yourself over, you don't have to worry about how it's going to get taken care of or anything. 
you, you can't mess it up. I'm telling you, you're in the tractor beam when you really give your heart over to this, and, and you cannot mess it up. You cannot take a wrong turn. Jesus will give you so many symbols like, did you get it yet? Here, I'll try again. Try that. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? It just kind of comes at you until you get the message. So it's, it's really a, it's a beautiful, beautiful message. Well, we're going to do a Q&A. We've got all of us up here. You watch the movie, and we sure you have questions maybe of experiences and how was it and what you go through. And, yeah, this is our arranged marriage here. <laughs> they, they came to our uh, monastery, and they were engaged to get married. And then during the movie, they got married. And so that they now, how many, that was on two and a half years ago. And so, yeah, you can ask all the questions about, because everybody, you know, arranged marriage is one thing, but then what, what's going on inside your mind, inside the marriage, and how is this being used for healing? And, you know, so feel free. We've got mics up here to ask, ask any questions. And, uh, yeah, we can even pass a mic out there in the audience if you have a question. It's water. That that's good. It'll evaporate. You can't mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, are there any questions that you'd like to ask of any of us? When you came, when you came to the mystery or the monastery, were you already engaged, or did you meet there? Yeah, when we came to the monastery, we were engaged. Yeah, we met two, three months before, I think. And our first step was actually engagement. It was not dating and seeing if we liked each other. It was actually hearing the guidance to make a commitment right away. So, yeah, <laughs> we had our first date after getting engaged. <laughs> I just want to share that when we met, we were married two months and ten days later. And we felt like we were marionettes, you know, that everything was orchestrated. And that's been oh, 38 years ago. So uh, it, we, had, we had an arranged marriage. Yeah. yeah. It was funny because David used the, the phrase, make a commitment, and the C word. And I'm going to college. And I did what every good, you know, young man does. I started backpedaling. You know, I, I, I'm not committing. And we were reading a book by um, Paul Williams, Das Energy. And I just, I just opened the book spontaneously. And on the page, I saw, make a commitment. And I threw the book across the room. And Kathleen says, you know, what? What, what is it? I went over and I found the page and I showed it to her. Well, a couple years ago, I came across Das Energy on my bookshelf. And I read the whole book. There's no page in the book that says, wow. make a commitment. And I'm telling you, my hair was standing on end as I read that book. So I hear you. That's so cool. <laughs> I, I, it's a question, I think, for you, Jeff. In what I, what I watched in watching you go through a dismantling, as I saw it, of perhaps the idea of um, the compression of form and being attracted to the form, and the form gets us hooked in, and then it's a, like a holy bait and switch to, to undo the form, undo the structure. And I've, I've, I've enjoyed watching you along the way with uh, your shares about your journey in 12-step and kind of a continuation here with the romantic paradigm, which seems so... Um, attractive, and certainly with younger, energetic bodies, and let's undertake this holy adventure and somehow do it in the context of the form to turn the form over and get to the get beyond the form. You know, we need a book to take us beyond the book. But I, but I, I um, resonated, I guess, with the anger of the betrayal, um, the betrayal, uh, uh, the jealousy dragon, and you know the 
the commitment perhaps into trying to make the specialness work for us. And then it's never, it's actually gonna work perfectly to not work for the reason we want it to work. <laughs> and then of course we feel the betrayal. And I, I was wondering because in my, recently for me, I have thought I had moved past that, but I discovered a whole bunch of anger that just blew up and came out one day because I discovered I'd been compromising and people pleasing, trying to make specialness still work for me and get the goodies, get that good stuff coming back, the, the affection or the attention or the, the support. And I, and I watched you go through that anger and the betrayal. I think those were the words used and I, I, I could relate to that. And I guess the question in here is, it seems for me, I, I, I pop back and forth, and so this is like the ultimate thing to use the form, use the structure, use the symbols, and not get stuck in the people pleasing and the private thoughts because I don't want to upset the apple cart. I, I still want to get some, some goodies here. And then discovering, and then I realized I was really pissed off at myself for compromising to begin with, and that was just a replay of the ontological compromise. But did you, how did you move through that? And it was wonderful to watch you break through in the voice and the sound. And you, you guys were so lovely there. Of like, I, I can't find my way through this. And then you started singing. And it was like, well, I, I want this too. I want the, the greater thing, not this low-hanging fruit of specialness. So I'm just curious as to how you have used this as continuing your journey to move beyond you know, like the, the steps. I have no idea. <laughs> That's actually the truth. When, uh, when Francis says we all shared a prayer at the beginning, my prayer in the group was, I want to, I want to experience a deeper level of trust. And <laughs> I can oh. get emotional even just talking about it. Because <clears throat> what we don't talk about in the film is I actually produced the film. And I paid for the whole thing, but I let go of any type of control over that, which wasn't easy either, but it was to trust Francis in that respect of she's going to make, I had a prior to make a movie my whole life, and you know, I kind of compromised from the age of 18 and what I was going to do for a career and all that, and so then I gave it over to the spirit, and it was like, okay, I had a prior I'll make an anonymous movie, <laughs> and this is how it shows <laughs> up, you know, and it is to undo all the credit and the things that I really, you know, approval, all the things that I really desired in my life. And with the relationship, I knew going into it, like when we had met, she showed up in Monterey. I picked her up from the airport and I actually heard that I would marry her. And, you know, I was like, oh, absolutely not. Like <laughs> judging her clothes and so forth at the time. <laughs> like, I'm not getting. Yeah, this is Monterey, Mexico. We were there, you know, working on the Spiri app that I know you're familiar with. And. So from that point, I knew that she had already had feelings for Jason and so forth, and, but there was an attraction, and I had a prayer. I said, okay, I'm in community. Let me be led through attraction, and I don't want to have to guess. You know, I don't want to. Everyone who comes in the community, there's a fear of, oh, I'm going to get hooked up with this one or believe that we're forced into a relationship. That's not the way it happens. It's led by the spirit and through attraction and so forth. And so it was clear to me that, okay, here's one that I'm attracted to, but the butt comes in, but yeah. there's feelings for someone else. Well, I had a lot of hurt in past relationships that I had never experienced, you know, or actually allowed up the anger, the hate, the betrayal. Mm -hmm. It happened twice to me, actually, with ones that I wanted to spend possibly a lifetime with. Mm -hmm. So I knew those were patterns, and I used to <laughs> ask Jason before that, like, is this something I'm going to have to look at? Like, am I going to have to go through something? He goes, well, you know, it all is dependent on whether I can release it, you know. And I had to. For me, I had to and when I look back, it was the most gentle thing. When you watch the movie, it doesn't look gentle or feel gentle in the moment. But when I watched this movie last night, I shared with Francis on the way home when I watched it, that scene, I fall more in love with myself and Soren every time. And there's no difference in the unrequited love that's going on in both of us. And even with Francis Romero, she has the, she wants to be loved for what she can do. I want someone to love me for who I think I am or for the person of Jeffrey. And so I watched the movie last night, and for the first time I was like, oh, my God, feeling that love deeper. And then what really caught me last night was 
you know, David always talks about this agape love and loving everyone equally. That is the goal. I mean, that's why I'm on this path. I want to experience that on a consistent basis. And last night when I watched it, and Francis has that beautiful narration right after the uh, Emily sings the uh, Nella Fantasia song, and she says, you know, can we ever love everyone equally? And she does that narration. And as soon as I wa- I was like, oh, my God, and I was in this state and then the pictures that they show after that is first it's Francis's face and then Kirsten and then Susanna and then Netta all ones who I love very deeply now (laughs) and it doesn't have to be this personal thing anymore you know because of the willingness to to face those patterns and so that is the fruits (laughs) that come from allowing it to to come up the anger and the oh my god I can't believe that this is happening to me it was happening for me to move through that stuff no I could so relate the past traumatic experiences of the betrayal of the um, the death wish not working out, you know, and 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 feeling the the gut punch of that, and but but being able to sit in it and say, okay, this is what's this is what's happening, what's here, and uh, thankfully for the tools of you know four agreements, course in miracles, to say, all right, I got to go deeper with this, I got to I got to welcome this gut punch, and it's here to help me push. To, it's the big squeezy, I call it. It's to squeeze me horizontal. Or, I'm sorry. To, to, it's the horizontal squeeze to squeeze me vertical to get into that point of view, to go beyond this um, perceived betrayal, but to see how it, how it symbolizes a choice I seem to be unconsciously making to compromise, to, to, to kind of keep seeking but not finding that game, and then getting vertical and how good that feels. And then all it's kind of like the MMA fighter of you just gut, bring on the gut punches because it, it's okay. It doesn't. It's not even uh, attractive anymore. But I just could relate to the what I felt for me fairly recently was a possession of an anger that I was thinking I had dealt with, but it was still lurking. And I looked at it, and I realized I I was still compromising the primary relationship, the holy relationship, still trying to get the nibbles and kibbles and bits of special relationship to find some kind of, um, maybe this will work after all. Only to kind of have that gut punch again, which is, oh, this is so familiar. And then the anger emerged, and I thankfully was aware enough to say, well, there's a possession there. And then um, turning the form over, doubling down on turning all forms over, all classrooms over, you know, for the purpose of healing and to allow my mind to be healed and to come into that awareness of the oneness across all, you know, the field, the the mind, the oneness, the holiness, which is that primary relationship, which is so sweet and obvious until it's not. And it was just fantastic to watch that. And and with the gift of Netta to facilitate that, to come through you, I I just was um, everything. There's so many good things about that film, but I really love the animals Every time you cut to the animals, they're just saying, hey, you dumb animals, what are you doing? <laughs> look at those dumb a- much ad- look at all those dumb animals over there. It just every time you cut to the animals, they were just in stillness and presence, just watching. And I thought, there it is. There's the still there's the presence. That's just uh, the, the that's forgiveness, you know. Quiet, still, not judging, just watching. What are these animals up to? But anyway, thank you. I, I just there was yeah. so many great parts. I can go on and on and on, but I won't. But mm. thank you. Thank you. I can say one other thing, and that's that this uh, the line from the course that you know future loss is not our fear, that present joining is our dread, and that was actually all the thoughts that I had around that was oh she's gonna end up with Jason later, all this stuff. It was all in my mind, and we talk about commitment. Make the commitment first. It was a fear of commitment for me. This was a commitment to spirit. Now it looked like a romantic relationship. and But as soon as that happened, and Susanna can maybe speak to this, the day of the ceremony, when we stood, stood up there, all of what she had like fell away, all this fear around, oh, is it going to be for... You know, it's always this idea that something's going to happen in the future. But it's really, I'm afraid of that connection, this true, yeah, this true feeling of, oh, my God, this means... Of course, there was a lot of plan Bs falling away from me because I didn't have ideas of marriage, but it's all that for me. It was all an experience of, oh, wow, it's never what I think it is. It's never something in the future. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Francis, um, I also have a dream of doing documentaries, 
And I have been at a place in my life where I feel like I have to have it all figured out before I move forward. And I just want to thank you so much for just the simple, consistent message that you've given us about trusting and not feeling like I'm a burden to God by going to him so much. And uh, that's, that's, and, and, it, and I also come from a 12-step background. And uh, so it's, you know, doing step work and some of the stuff that I'm hearing here is so consistent with some of the truths that I've learned through the 12 steps. And, um, but one of them that came out for a pattern for me was my identification with God as the, I associated the authority figures that I experienced as a child with my higher power. And because I had experienced neglect, I felt like I was a burden if I went to God too much. And I just thank you for continually repeating that it's okay and necessary, you know, to go to God and that it's a process of learning how to trust. And, um, and this topic of relationships, um, that there is a way to gently confront without attacking and I saw you do that during the film where you created a safe space, but you were not, um, you weren't allowing any slack. You know, it's like, I'm going to give you this opportunity to come to the surface with what's going on. And you mentioned triggers, you know, and like helping them find that truth within themselves and then bringing it up. And then to watch your response when it did to not take it personally and not feel attacked or feel like you had to defend or change what they were feeling just to let it come up. And like an, a curiosity, you know, it's like, hmm, what's going on? You know, and then when it would come up, even though it was seemingly directed at you, it really wasn't. You know, it was really about them just getting transparent and holding that space like you did. And uh, I've, I'm just curious because I don't know the story behind the arrangement. I don't know who arranged you. So I'm just, oh, okay, so you just knew that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was JC Central Casting, as David <laughs> likes to say. <laughs> um, it was an exploration in the beginning because um, at, at some point after we met, like a month afterwards, we felt like a lot of attraction toward each other. So we actually just exposed that in, in the group. Like, this is what I'm feeling and this is what I think I want. And just actually opening up about that first and then... You know, the, the way that the structure is set up is we join with our brothers and to hear what the guidance is. So there's there's other brothers around us that are very devoted. Like, I mean, ones are like Francis and David, and we would join with, with ones like them. Look, this is what we're thinking. This is how we're feeling. Do you have any insights about what feels good or, or what, you know, feels like is the guidance? And... In the beginning, when we joined, it just felt like, no, this this is a distraction. This is not for now. Just focus on your project. So we tried, and it felt like <laughs> it was really hard. <laughs> like it would not go away. And and Jeffrey actually ended up making a decision, like um, he was going to uh, go to the U.S. And, and, and buy a house in Park City. So that meant that, okay, so we're, we're going to split paths, and we weren't going to see each other again. That was the feeling. And then on the way to the airport, I remember Jeffrey was driving David to the airport. I was in the car, and we, and we just, David brought up, like, yeah, I heard you guys were feeling attracted to each other, and, yeah, I, got, I give you my blessing. Like, that was the last thing we actually needed to hear because it felt like we needed some confirmation because both of us had a deep prayer, like, I don't want to make this decision myself mm -hmm. at all because whatever I decided for my relationships did not work out well. Same for him, and this relationship is a different purpose. Like, we want for this to be used to undo who we think we are rather than go around that same pattern, you know, like whatever you're trying with this relationship, it doesn't work out. Try another one, try another one. Try and find the right person to make you feel good. But just just feeling, like, so certain in our purpose, like, no, this is not, I don't want to do that ever again. Like, if this relationship is given it has to be Jesus's relationship and it has to be used by him 
so make it obvious. And, and it, it became obvious through a channel that we felt like we could trust and we could, you know, hear from. So that, that's kind of how that got arranged. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to hear you talk more about what guidance is like in the moment. Like I'm, I, in my experience, it feels like guidance comes in a lot of different ways. It can be someone else talking to you, or like you said, the audible voice that you heard. And but the reason I'm asking is I feel times in my life when I'm at a crossroad and I'm waiting for an answer and nothing's coming, and it feels like, it feels glitchy, like the leading feels like it's here, it's not here. And I, in those experiences, I try to just trust and feel like maybe there's not an answer, but in that moment, there's such a temptation to doubt your guidance, and, and so, I try to not go there and not doubt that I'm being guided. But it just feels a little, like, messy and confusing. And I, I want to say to God, I do say it. I'm here. I'm waiting. But I can't tell which way to go. Nothing's coming. So I just want to hear times like that, what your thoughts are, what your prayer is. Yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful line in the Course that says, there are many answers you have received but have not heard. So I think of it like um, there's another part that Jesus says, um, talking about giving miracles away. He says, open up the storehouse of your mind and give them away. So I, I, I think if we start to think of we have received, um, the Spirit's with us, we have within us all the answers to any conceivable problem or emotion that confronts us. But the resistance to hearing that is, it relates back to the fear of, of loss. Um, there's the belief that the Holy Spirit will, wants to take something away from us. Because even though the Holy Spirit answered the belief in separation instantaneously, when the mind seemed to follow the, the ego's voice and get all attached to time and space and then become accustomed to time and, time and space and then become familiarized with time and space and even use the home word, oh, I'm home, country road, take me home, you know, but it's not West Virginia. <laughs> and there's a part of us that... that Ego wants it to be West Virginia, or wants it to be a place. Uh, and yet we know home is where the heart is. We know that it's much, much deeper, is where our true feeling of home. So, I think that's why we oftentimes speak it up, like um, when they had attractions, or they have doubts, or whatever. The more transparent you become, the more willing you, you are not to hide anything. I think that takes us closer to that hearing, that inner hearing that is what the guidance is. But sometimes there are defense patterns that we're not even conscious of. And um, I think about, even with the Course, I mean, the Course is so clear and direct, but it took about 2,000 years from the time when Jesus appeared to have this Course. So I'm thinking that, that fog, that ego fog, must be pretty thick if it takes Jesus 2,000 years to get something this direct, that he can correct the Bible, he can correct all kinds of things with a, a great scribe. Uh, and Helen apparently had a, this great, highly developed scribal ability, but she had misused it in a previous lifetime as a priestess. <laughs> and so she had tremendous guilt around misusing the gift, and that, therefore, uh, she did receive an early message. The, the world is worsening to an alarming extent, and people are being called from all over to accept their part in the plan of awakening. In one sense, it was a little bit of a rush job. Uh, she still had lingering guilt from the misuse lifetimes before of the scribal ability, 
But it was like, well, she's the best we've got, and she's going to go through a lot of resistance uh, with this course because of the guilt. But she'll do it. Somewhere deep in her mind, she's like, send me, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so she had seven intense years of scribing the course. From what I've heard internally, that if she had that gift of scribal ability without that extra guilt, it could have been done maybe like a year or a year and a half. But it took, you know, took all that time because Jesus would actually scribe things to her and she would write it down in shorthand and then he would say, now what I said was this, what you wrote was that. See, the ego fear would even mess up the scribal ability, even though it was really good. It would distort the, um, the words. And so Jesus would say, now let's go back. And he had to keep going back. Here's what I said. Here's what I want you to write. And so it, it was a lot of patience and everything like that. Now, if you apply that to what you're talking about, you, you have to give yourself the, the blessing of thinking, I, deep down I do want to hear. I really do. And there are times when I, I say, here I am, Lord, and I ask and, and I don't receive. But that's the time to be real gentle on yourself. And since you know it comes in many, many different ways, uh, I would see it more as playful at the beginning where I wouldn't push it. And then sometimes I'd hear it on a song on the radio or a bumper sticker, a billboard, somebody speaking to me. Um, the course, I was so excited when I was going to course groups at the beginning that I was just filled up with all this joy and all these miracles and go to my parents' house and I would sit there just ready to burst with all this joy and occasionally it would spill out and I'd share a few things and again and again until my mother finally said, uh, I don't need a minister. Uh, I already have a minister. Mm-hmm. And I thought, pay attention, David, here. And then a little bit later she said, uh, I think you need to find other people to share this with. And I was like, oh, that's Jesus. That's Jesus is channeling directly to my mother. I think you need to find other people to share this with. And sure enough, I did. I needed to let Jesus direct where I would go, who I would speak to. That's, a, that's one of those key early lessons. Where you have to, the miracles come from Jesus, but he has to be the one that they can't be done indiscriminately with anyone, any place, any time. He has to direct who's, who's ready to hear it. And then for ourselves, when we see ourselves as a person, we just have to be very gentle and say, well, I'm here, and get through to me any way that you can. I I really want to want (laughs) to hear. (laughs) And then, you know, it's it's slowly, it does happen. It does happen. I really appreciate you saying about describing because I had that experience in what I would call past lives of uh, healing and misusing the healing and then in this life I misused healing and I just stopped and I was scared to death to ever do any kind of healing again or any um, any experience like that because I, I just I brought back I'll screw it up I'll do it wrong, I, you know. And um, so that really, I, I didn't know that about the scribing, that she had had that experience. And it's so deep that, you know, you hesitate to breathe because <laughs> you're afraid you're going to, or I'm afraid I'm going <coughs> to screw it up. And um, so th- I, I just needed to say that. And I've had that experience with, I mean, I've had some wonderful experiences with Jesus, and I um, had a abusive background, um, severely abusive, and I had a time that I was just held by Jesus, and I remember that. And I, any time I doubt, I remember being held in His arms, and He held my soul, and my body was being mutilated, and I, you know, it's just something I remember. But I don't share that with anyone. I, it's kind of like a secret. 
And again, I'm afraid I'll mess up the slide. And <laughs> I was just talking um, th that uh, I'm 79. I just turned 79, and I think maybe I'm too old to do this. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't. And then I'm thinking, now wait. <laughs> and my mother lived to 104, and I did make the doctor promise that before 100, I want to get out of here. <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't promise that. But <laughs> but I could have another 20 years or so. And, um, you know, I'm ready for a commitment to follow the way. And I am scared that I'll mess up both those parts. Yeah, I think sometimes that... It's so, it's almost like a, a temptation for the mind to conclude something. And from, from my whole life, the parable of David, Jesus has always said, just watch, feel, okay, don't conclude, don't conclude anything. Like, because it, nothing ever is concluded in time and space. Anyway, we have to go all the way back into the atonement in our mind. And... And yet, I do find it, that's how Jesus, Jesus, um, it's kind of like that, um, that verse about no matter how many times, maybe it was Rumi or Gibran, the, it was that thing, no matter how many times you've broken your vows or whatever, come back, come to me again. Well, Francis and I had an experience where we went to, uh, um, to China and we were doing some gatherings there, I think it was in Shanghai, and this woman had come to us. Uh, I mentioned the, the gentleman who brought the the course to China the first time, Nashin. This was his partner, Shaje, and Shaje had um, had had this experience of listening, hearing Jesus's voice, and and channeling, and all these things, and then she lost it, uh, and she was she wanted to meet with me privately, and then when I met with her, she was just heartbroken, almost like. She had the greatest gift that she could ever imagine, and she lost it. And she had tremendous fear and guilt around that too. And will I ever? Will it ever come back? And and we just joined together and and prayed. And then I said, "Yes, yes, it will be back. You can just relax." I think it was back the next day um, <laughs> after she uh, joined with me and relaxed. That she was like. Oh my God, I, I'm hearing. She was just like a little girl. The glee was so strong again. But, but the main thing is not to conclude anything. It's, it's kind of like putting money in a bank. You know how they said compounded daily like interest? Like if we compound the fear and the doubt, we conclude something and then we just keep compounding it day after day, it starts to be like the abyss. You know, we feel so detached and so, uh, so far away. But, uh, yeah, Jesus doesn't believe in this compounding thing. You know, he's into come back to, the, to freedom, come back to me, you know, realize that, that the Holy Spirit will correct all mistakes that you think you made kind of retroactively, that if we have this sense of openness, it will, the Holy Spirit will just take away all those mistakes if we'll give them to him. And it's not like this thing we have to do penance and we have to just burn off this, you know, this guilt or this karma, you know, in the long, long term. It, it can be much quicker if we're willing, if we're really sincere and willing. So I think that's beautiful that you can take that, you know, to stay open. I'm just curious if you would share, I know Francis has shared with me her story of how she came to this path but the two of you coming from different directions meeting and so forth how did you come to this particular path that you knew this is where you wanted to be and this is how you wanted to be well I can uh, I can share with you my my path was pretty rapid. As I shared, I was in a 12-step recovery, and I was 39 and a half when I entered that, and it was a deep surrender point. So I actually experienced, I had an experience of revelation 
as a result of the third step of recovery, which is I surrender my will and my life to a higher power. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't, I had a hard time sharing it with people. I was like, people are going to think I'm nuts and all this kind of stuff. And, but where it happened, it happened in a recovery facility. And I just was aware of what was going on in the place. And I was like, oh, wow. They literally had like, movie list. You could only watch these movies and everyone was workers among workers. There was no specialness. Everyone had their own function. We had literally like expression sessions each morning. We would pray together and then we had a book that we would go through the directions in the book and I was like this is how you undo the ego. Like <laughs> by joining like this. And so after my experience there I had a prayer. I'm like I want to find a place that's like this that I could live. So I I actually looked online for communities. I didn't find Living Miracles at the time. I saw some places and it was like, ah. Oh. So it wasn't until a year after, and I threw myself into recovery, like sponsees and meetings. Never went back to work. I had had an experience of realizing that this was all a scam. So I'm like, I remember telling my first sponsor, he's like, you willing to do anything? I said, I said everything except go back to my job. <laughs> because he tried to convince me. He's like, well, you got a great job. You should probably go back. I said, no, I won't do that, but I'll do everything else. Literally, I knew that I couldn't trust that voice in my head because I'd had that experience. And so he said, I think you should stay at your parents for six months. I said, okay. And I would listen and follow to everything that my sponsors at the time would do. And then I finally met a guy in a room. He walked into the room and there was an instant connection. This guy had literally just walked out of jail that day. He was in prison for six years. And when he walked in the room, I felt him. I was like, oh, my God, who is this guy? And he stood up and he spoke. And he's like, you know, just from the heart. And I was like, oh, I love this guy. <laughs> so I went and I talked to him afterwards. And he's like, yeah, we should get together sometime. Maybe we'll start a book club. You ever read it? And at the time, he said, Emmett Fox. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. That day, I went home. And I got onto my computer looking up A Course in Miracles for the first time. I didn't ever open the book. And he calls me. And I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, hey, did you ever hear of A Course in Miracles? I'm like, I'm on the computer looking it up right now. <laughs> so we actually started, just me and him, a book club down by the river. And we would read the course together. And he was the first one I shared my experience with. The, you know, the, the really, I mean, you can never actually explain it, but just what my feelings were and everything throughout it. And he was like, you need to read Gary Renard in Disappearance of the Universe. So I read that book, and then I looked up and I saw that Gary was coming to New York City, Manhattan, the following week. And so I was like, okay. So I went to Manhattan, and the very first night, I walked into a room and David was speaking. He was the first Course of Miracles, I won't use the word teacher, but he was the first one I heard speak, and he was speaking exactly what I needed to hear. I never had to hear anything from anyone else, and... He talked about the community. There was another member there, Ricky, who was playing her music, and I was just, there was an instant connection. And I ended up calling David the following Monday. He, he was driving to Kentucky after that, and it was just before he was going to Mallorca, and I called him. I'm like, hey, listen, where are you going? I'll fly anywhere you are. I'd love to find out more about this community. And uh, so then when he got back from Mallorca, he was having a retreat at the monastery, and I flew out and when I got there, I just knew that these the devoted ones that I saw in action, what they were doing, the practical application. And I was still in Lesson 31 when I actually met them. But it was just I knew there was a deeper call in my heart that this is what I wanted to do. Because I had that experience of what else would I want to do but you know devote my life to the purpose of forgiveness or looking at the guilt. So that's how, how my my rather quick journey came to meeting these guys. Yeah, I could share um, my story. <laughs> it's, um, I'm not sure exactly where to start with it because it feels like it was like somehow something was always woven into my life. Like I'm looking for something because this world doesn't make sense. And um, like even going to school, I hated it. I was like, this is not going to be my life. I refuse. <laughs> like, there must be another way. Like, I I'd had this, uh, this strong belief that I could, there was a way where I could be happy all the time. And, and I didn't know how, but I just knew, like, there's this, this state of mind that exists. And so I, I had that in mind. I just had no idea how to get there, like, at all. 
n not a clue. And at the same time, it was like there is no doubt that that exists. So, um, you know, my, my mother and my aunt that you saw in the film, like, we were very close, the three of us, and um, they were also very much looking for uh, another way. Like, they had similar kind of experiences, like, this, there, there must be something more because this, this is not enough. <laughs> and um, so they would, they would be searching and trying out all these different spiritual paths, and I would just kind of listen. And then I heard them talk about the course at some point, and they were saying what, what it said, and I was like, oh, yeah, something about that really resonates. And so I was just listening to their conversations, or I would ask a question every now and then, but that's kind of how I got introduced to the course. And it took me a while to actually start reading it, because I, I, I just couldn't understand what it said somehow. So I, I actually, too, came in through the disappearance of the universe, uh, you know, my mom was like, read that. It'll help you understand. And, um, but yeah, and, and actually my mom also forwarded me a video of David. Like, she forwarded me videos of all these other teachers, and I'm like, no, no, don't feel that. Don't feel, something doesn't feel right. And then a, a video of David came by, and I'm like, hmm, this feels like this is what I've always believed in. Like, it's in front of my face. Like, it's showing me that it's possible. So there was just, like, this instant recognition for me. And at some point, um, David came to Holland. And um, my mom signed me up for the retreat. <laughs> it was great, because I, I really needed it. I flew in the, the day before from the other side of the world. And I showed up, and I was like, oh, my God. And the moment I walked in there, and, and I think, I don't even know if this is true anymore, but, like, the order has been kind of, foggy but I think David was sitting on stage and, and Francis was there and Kirsten and they were just sitting and there was this music playing and I sat down and like I was just like this is it like there, there was no question in my mind like this is this is what I've always been looking for this is what I've been longing for like this feeling right now <laughs> you know and I mean, it took me a while before I actually came because they came back the next year. And then, and then actually, <laughs> I filled out a devotional stay application to come to the community. But it, it just felt like I had all these things in my life that, that just nothing worked out. And I, I knew in the back of my mind, like, this is not going to work out. Like, school, job, house, hobbies, anything. It, it's just like a dead end. But I also had this feeling like I just need to know for sure. <laughs> like, I need to try. And then it was like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, okay, well, I kind of knew this was my path. And now I can't. I don't have an excuse, really, anymore not to fully go there. So that's how I ended up with, with these guys. <laughs> yeah, I think, too, the uh, part of it, too, is early in the workbook, Jesus says you... in. In no situation do you understand your best interest, which is pretty strong. Like in, I'm like, in no situation, like that's pretty strong. And then the next lesson, he says, everything is in your own best interest, uh, meaning that that's the fact of it, <laughs> and you don't you don't know your own best interest in any situation, and yet everything that happens is for your own best interest. So it's like there's a gap there. And then I think you start to see like like you just don't know how this healing or this undoing can occur. You know, thoughts are like, oh, I'm, I'm a tough nut to crack or I'm a slow learner already and I'm stubborn, I'm resistant, and then and I'm going to get to everything is for my own best interest. It's almost like that seems like such a high state of mind. But I have found that, that the Holy Spirit, even with Helen and Bill, um, she was very, she would be so aligned with Jesus, and then when she got off, she was way off. And Bill was more repressed, but he was a little more steady, so he was able to be more like the stabilizing force. So he had the great aligner with the great stabilizer, and then Bill hired Helen uh, at Columbia Presbyterian. He was her boss hired her in 1958 and then the course started coming to her in 1965 seven years later and there must be a better way 
But I think too, I believe there was one point, Susanna, where you had told somebody, I will never get married. Uh, so there was the, I will never get married. And, and Jeffrey's like thinking, I don't really need to get married. You know, I, I don't mind relationships. Uh, I like relationships, but, but I don't need a, a commitment and everything. So you can see, it's almost like Jesus and the Spirit, they know just what the circumstances are. Okay, we got to never get married and a, a real resist one is. He's resist. I'll just put those two together. Voila. And, and meanwhile, they don't see it coming, you know. And then, <laughs> but that's the way these arranged marriages, even like in India, happen. You know, where there's no sense of any kind of factors going into it, except the, the parents are supposed to be very prayerful and very devoted traditions, you know. Like, this is no small thing uh, for two people. to Even if they're like Gandhi getting married when he was in his teen mid-teens and his wife's very young, there's a, there's a feeling like this is very sacred, this is very important, this is not casual at all. This is for the undoing of the ego. This is for self-realization. And so I think that's beautiful. That's part of the dynamics with Helen and Bill and also for both of you that, that you made that commitment. You got engaged before your first date. So that was like a sign of like, wow, there's something important underneath this. And it's almost like Jesus knew you needed that engagement or commitment knowing, you know, where you both were at. Like, if this is going to happen, it's got to have just the right conditions. So, yeah, maybe either one of you want to speak to that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I can share this. When, when we actually drove to the airport that day, I mean, again, when the guidance comes in, like, we know the answer or whatever, but there was resistance for me. So I had attraction, so it was like, oh, yeah, I'd like to like Dave was, have a relationship, you know, relationship just this much, but... And David was, it was like, we're driving. He was so matter of fact. He's like, yeah, I think that will bless the whole. And yeah, and even a marriage, she can get a green card. I was like, <laughs> I'm driving. I'm like, Mar- marriage? We never said anything about that. <laughs> but it was my prayer being answered that I didn't really know what it was. And it was like, wow. So I remember that very distinctly. Uh, and then, you know, actually looking back, I can say that I knew or I can see that it was all for my own undoing because a relationship like that was I wouldn't make the full commitment like I was saying before like because I had so much fear that a full commitment to a marriage was like whoa that was too I needed to hear it from someone that I trusted that it was like okay well all right now I can actually start stepping in that direction seeing it's not what I think so that was yeah pretty profound moment for me in my life Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, for myself, I, I could feel I, I needed the commitment. I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but I was like, no, I'm, I'm never going to get married. That was like one of my rules that I set up long ago. Like, I, I, I'm just not, yeah, that's just not my life. And, and But actually, looking back now, I can feel like I needed that commitment, and it needed to come first. So I, I don't know that I can explain why, but it, it just felt like, wow, that that. The way that that was orchestrated, if I look back, it's just perfect. <laughs> there are a couple of things. There was a real sweet moment, and I shared this with Jeffrey. When you know, you're know you signing <coughs> the marriage certificate, the formalizing of this relationship appearing in form, but for clearly for a holy purpose. And and just the look on your face was, was kind of could see the, the, the panoply of thoughts going, what the hell am I doing? But I'm in. And then the little pinky in, you know, kind of like a pinky swear. Okay, I'll go pinky swear. Pink, <laughs> pinky swear. I'm good with pinky swear. That feels good. And then the, then the pull in, <laughs> you know, then it was like, then it was kind of like when you both were trying to get there with that singing. I don't know how to get here. I don't know. I, I, I can't do this alone. And I'm, I'm so angry and I don't know what's going on. And then you break through together. And that was such a sweet moment. That was that was it, and that that scene, I love that scene because it was that doubt, my own doubt of like, whoa, I'm, I'm committing my I'm committing myself to something here, and it I don't know about this, but then it's like okay, we're we're in. This is just what it looks like, and I felt that too that you needed a sense. It's kind of like I I need a sense of I. It's like 
Holy Spirit needs relation form to get us beyond the form. So you, I felt, needed that kind of right here. Here's the pen. You know, you roll the pen down, sign it's okay. Like you needed that to, to step in and you needed to step through it in your own way. But I just loved how that unfolded. And it just came back into the joining seemingly in bodies. But we, it's like, no, the higher call. But my, my question for Francis is the whole Soren thing. Man, that was exquisite. And just how you, you um, your, your dedication and devotion to the purpose of this film. And by the way, I, I would love to subtitle this film The Prayer of St. Francis. Because that's really what's going on here is not just your prayer, but the prayer of St. Francis to turn it around. To go beyond, you know, the needing and the wanting of the specific egoic structure. That was just one thought that came out. Oh, this is the prayer of saying, oh, that fits. Um, but the Soren journey, with, with which I think was reflected across all the stories, I, I could so relate to that because I saw him in that, that, that the, the ego's use of memory. When he was in community, he felt attracted to the bigger thing, and then he saw his love interest. And he saw the image of, of love and, and how he, he felt... Um, embarrassed, and he couldn't let that feeling come up because how silly is that to express this feeling of love that we would I mean, he repressed it. And as I understood it, he doubled down on his work and he became really good at his, his, his job and making filmmaking sound and everything and kind of buried it. And so when the, the next opportunity comes along and you have this great opportunity and then here's love coming through again, Oh, I'm I'm going to be picked. I'm, I can help. I, let me let me participate for these other seeming reasons of I'm a good sound guy and we can produce this and it'll be successful and this is how you make it. In other words, I'm a professional and you guys are amateurs. <laughs> I loved I loved just watching his evolution of coming into the the deeper barriers and how that played into your prayer. And I talked to you about this earlier and then watching him come to the realization of it was love calling him again and he still wanted to he was frustrated and angry and wanted to project it onto the 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 image that's not giving me what i think i want in my my littleness but that needed to be shattered and how were how were you able to hold to your purpose in spite of what appears to be something coming in form as a response to your prayer to help you make this film and I think you used a golden term that's really helped me here to help me in my, my journey, the barometer. What's the barometer of discernment between like a specialness, people-pleasing um, capitulation I might uh, um, entertain versus holding to that true purpose to go beyond people-pleasing and um, get to the feeling of it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Soren is such a like because I met him before this movie. Like a, a year ago, I met him in in Copenhagen. That was all a miracle story, actually. To to even be going over there because we always go where we're invited. We're never really trying to make a gathering or a retreat happen. But that was the time when we get an invitation from Aarhus, Denmark. And um, my friend Jenny and I, we were saying, okay, let's, seems like there's a calling in Aarhus. And I said, I just, I don't know why I feel Copenhagen. I just, so they say, well, there's no, nobody that invites us in Copenhagen. So I said, what if, what if we just put a post on Facebook <laughs> basically saying, does anybody want to invite us to Copenhagen? <laughs> and he replied in five minutes, Soren five minutes because apparently he was he left the community very hurt and shut down for 10 years living in his own apartment making his film uh, his own documentary but so shut down from relationship in guilt and shame and then with just before that he started to open up to course again course in miracles again and he really feel the call to to do something about it and to, to, to invite the healing back to his life again. So when he saw that message, he jumped on it. So when we m- met, um, 
I said, what we do you do? He said, I'm a filmmaker. I said, oh, wow, I'll keep that in mind. If this, <laughs> this movie that it's like uh, wh- God knows when comes back, I will contact you. And he said, okay. And he, at that point, he asked me, so who has the final cut? I said, what, do, what does that mean? He's, final cut means who has a final say about the, uh, what the movie is going to look like. I said, what, do you, what I don't know. He said, I want to have the final cut. He wants to have it. I said, let's talk about it when it reaches the point. Because <laughs> that was not in my mind, like uh, how it works and, and none of it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, actually, it was very quick. Probably eight months later, this project came, came through, through different ways. So I remember Soren, so I called him. I said, look, it seems like this is happening. Are you in? You can, you can come over. And he's like, yeah, I'm in. And I said, what do you want to do? At that point, we already had someone sign up as a director who, direct, who um, later on put out. And he said, okay, since like you have everything else, I can be uh, um, focusing on audio. So I said, okay, great. And then at some point, the fear got very high before he came, he wanted to pull out. Um, when he heard this director is going to come in to direct the movie in such a way that is, you know, you know we, we aim for end results, we're going to distribute this way. He's like, I, I, seems like you have everything, I'm out. And I said, no, Soren, don't go, don't leave. Um, I said, he, t- he reminded me, I forgot, he said, you said to me, you don't know how big your part will be at that point. And he, so Soren said, okay then. But very quickly, that director pulled out, so the whole thing started to turn around. So we got together, and yeah, it was very quick because he came in, we we were very clear at the beginning this whole project was for healing. And if you remember Soren's prayer at the beginning was he wants to learn to be transparent. That was his prayer at the very beginning. That was his first line. And then I watched the last line. I just picked up yesterday. His last line in the movie was he recounted the past experience and he said, I hated him, her and hated myself because I don't want to be transparent. So the prayer was I, I want to learn to be transparent. And the past hatred was because I, I don't want to be transparent. So that was the prayer. And then got into the month. It was just, um, it was beyond our control. There was so many things that come up. He had all this desire to direct the, the whole thing. And of course, it is a call for love. You, you know, very clear because this is where they feel they can contribute, they want to get approved, they want to see that they are still worthy of love. So it's very quick that it becomes like that. And um, for me, I think, yeah, I, I talked a little bit yesterday. For me, it was this fine line of discerning what can bring present peace. Because this whole morning we were talking about the ego project back to the past and back to the future. So everything that, there were a lot of opinions about this is the things that we used to do, these are the things the film industry um, guidelines, this is the thing, and if you want to produce it in the future, this is how you do it. But in all of those discussions, there was no peace, there was no connection. I couldn't find the connection because there was frustration, anger, and stress. So from the beginning, I just thought, you know, I, I don't know how to do this, but I know how to, how to join. That's one thing we learn how to do in this whole thing. I, I know how to join. And talking about not worry about productivity, I have to, you know, we have a month, but if we don't produce anything, at least we can clear the air because yeah. that is our purpose. We want to clear all the crap out of our mind and whatever that's brought up. So that's what we dedicated to actually day in, day out. Suzanne and Jeffrey are all in the meetings. We were every day just, okay, let's, let's clear the anger because <laughs> that's how we basically, the moment I, I will write down the instructions, I pray and I hear and I deliver. Ah, that's not the way. Then let's talk. Let's talk about the 
Let's talk about the, the grievances and attack thoughts. So everything is shared. There is no push away. There is no repression. But the parameter for me is what feels most relaxing. Because the spirit's way is not a, a, an effort. It's not stress. It's not like, go, go, go. Let's get this done. The spirit's way is, oh my God, I feel the connection with you. I feel the love. Let's, let's move on in joy. Let's, every day should be devoted to miracles. What about miracles? Do we feel the miracle in this? If there's no miracle, what are we doing here? <laughs> so it was like a lot of the talks about are we doing this for happiness or doing this for end result? We have to come back to happiness. We have to. You know, this is, this is what we're like primarily dedicated to. And Soren is just so great because he's like a, someone who sits on a ball of anger all the time, and you can feel it. It's just like an elephant in the room all the time. So it feels like for me, I just want him to, to do it, to just say it, to, to break free from it. glaciers and icebergs and frozen rivers and just the, the, the melting and the coming forward of the tears like those were like there it is it was like okay it's it's here's my feelings i'm going to be transparent in my feelings and boy there's, there's the healing and kind of you you two are coming into the healing and all right game on journey on let's let's un, let's erase some more let's undo some more <laughs> let's yeah. some more stuff. it's like the beautiful thing i've seen over these years of community is that that there's this thing that Helen and Bill had, which was called, Jesus calls it an absence from felicity, the book, Complementary Ego Dynamics. So it's like, okay, what does Jesus mean by complementary ego dynamics? But these are dynamics that can be juxtaposed in a way to loosen the defense in both. And in, with Helen and Bill, you know, ha- Helen drew Bill more into alignment and, and consistency and, and strength away from his weakness because a lot of his repression was part of a weakness. And I see with all the projects that, you know, we had our communities grown and shrunk in size over the years, but sometimes we've had 40, 45 people or more. But, but with all the projects, it's like Jesus gives us the projects, then he gives us the configurations on who's on the team. And then... It's not like a worldly thing where you try to get the best team for productivity or the best team to get the job done the fastest or the best team for most efficient. He's con- configured the group based on what will bring the healing about in the fastest way. Like, for example, our monastery is out on 49 acres out in uh, a canyon in rural Utah, and there was a time where, you know, we felt that the lower part of the canyon could be used as kind of like a campground, so it was a collaboration. None of us are campground builders. We don't know about water permits and and electrical permits and all the permits that you have to do to build anything, but it's just holy encounter after holy encounter, and and everything was used to to loosen the mind from the ego and to listen and follow. Then there was one point where it came to, to build the campground and we had two or three people that were had construction skills like Soren had the movie making skills. These these guys had the construction skills and they were like, let me at it. like Let me get down there in the mud and let me build the thing. And I prayed and there was a woman in our community who has passed. She's the first woman in our community, anyone who's passed. Her name was Lila. She had come out of corporate. But to be a woman in corporate, you know, she had to be wear the mask and play the game and be tough and do all these things. She had no skills in construction um, whatsoever, but she was just learning to speak for authentically from her heart without censoring and filtering things. And so I got them all together, and I said, well, we're, we're guided. We're going to do a campground here. And Lila, you're 
you're going to lead the whole team. And you should have seen these two guys. They came up, they followed me around. They were like, what, have you gone crazy, David? You're not going to put her in charge of the campground team. And I said, oh, yes, uh, she's the one. She will lead it. And Lila prayed, and she journaled, and she communicated, like Francis was talking about with these. And, and it was a beautiful. She grew in the strength of trusting her inner voice. And they learned to, to let go of their I know mind of past learning. And I could see that was very much how these projects work. They're, they're put together not for productivity or efficiency, but for what's the best way for healing. And I've watched that in Jesus pairing up relationships and all the constellations over the years. Oftentimes, if somebody has a real strong willingness to heal, it's not so much important on their skills and abilities. In fact, for myself, you know, I, I didn't know anything about building websites or doing lots of things, but I was very prayerful and devotional. And sometimes I'd have a team of four or five people, and then I'd think, wow, this is great. Look at this team. This is going to happen now. And then the team would fall away, all of them. And I would be like, oh, what a bummer. That's like, we, we get all geared up and, and Jesus would say, I'm here. And uh, you and I can do this. And I'd be like, okay. And then he would channel through the skills. He would have me sit down at a computer and just sit down there. And he would start channeling building websites, programming through me, uh, starting a server. While I'm traveling around the world, he had me buy a server off of eBay. And I'm like, what? And then put it in the closet, and then he showed me how to set it up and everything. And meanwhile, when I went to Argentina, the, the server went down. <laughs> and he said, patience, David, patience, because there was nobody. But he was like showing me that with me... All things are possible. You know how it says in the Bible, with God, all things are possible. He was showing me that the collaboration was really vertical. That I was used to 10 years of university and who's my team players. And, you know, we've all been let down when we have partners or team players. And then the team players won't play, won't play along. Or they, worse, they leave. And they leave you holding the bag. But Jesus would always use it to say, oh, I'm here. No problem. Yeah, this is, we can do this. You know, we don't need a bunch of people. We can do this, you know, you and I. So I think that that comes strong through with Soren because Soren had this, all these skills, and it was almost like for him, it was like a, a put down to just be doing sound. Almost like this is a waste of time. I'm with a bunch of amateurs, and they're bungling it every day. And then, amazingly, though, Soren healed through that whole experience. And then it, the story with Soren just goes on and on. Like, if we, if we had him here, he's got so many skills. He has shipbuilding skills, all kinds of tech skills. He is loaded. He's Mr. Skilled. You know, talk about Mr. Handy with just about anything you can name. He can do so many things. But he was hiding his skills because he didn't want a sense of responsibility. You know, I'm not going to let on and let the people know all at once all I can do. So little by little, he has hung in there in community, and we needed lofts built in, um, in Spain, and we were like, architecturally, how are we going to build these lofts under these, these roofs and everything? And he's, well, I have shipbuilding skills. <laughs> and he, he could do the wood, the design, the architecture. We're like, Soren. It just he just keeps blossoming and growing, but he had had this experience ten years ago in that community, Andrew Cohen's community over there, where he just totally shut down and isolated. He just went lived in his apartment alone, and all these skills were just buried. You know they were not used. So, but this is kind of giving you insight into whatever skills and abilities you seem to have. The Spirit will use those. It's not like you have to reinvent the wheel and learn all new skill sets. The Spirit will use what you already have in place, but also the Spirit will use these collaborative ventures where if you just desire to collaborate and you want to say, we're all in this together, we're all here for the healing and for the same purpose, then 
like musicians jamming together where entire songs can come through just from all everybody willing to be there together. It's a, quite amazing. You show up. You were saying, I do know I can join. And, and the rest you didn't know how it would happen. But your patience came from all those years of practicing joining, connecting in mind, connecting in mind, and trusting that the Spirit, Jesus would handle everything else. And it really worked out beautifully in this movie, for sure. That, that scene where he's looking at his iPhone, his iPhone and he's watching her from back in the day, the love, the love symbol, and the community, the documentary, that he, it, it, felt, it felt like a, re, like a full yeah. healing there. Yeah. And it reminded me of the, the movie Her. It's kind of like it's uh, Segura Ross has that that song Sven Engler where it sounds like the, the lyrics are saying it's you, it's yeah. you, yeah. and I just felt that of, of his I felt his heart like still watching the images from back in the day, but it was it's you it was you then and it's you now. That's yeah. exactly. I want to explain a little bit that thing. I don't know whether it ruins it because it was a mystical experience he had, but I couldn't explain except just showing it, hoping that people somehow can pick it up. But what happened, this is how healing happens. So he was hiding all of these things in his mind until, you know, like on that day, he revealed this most embarrassing secret. Like it was, he just let it out. And after that, he, how how is this getting get healed? Because he, after he let out his secret, he felt very embarrassed, extremely afterwards, and then he went to his his home, uh, his apartment there. And um, that one of his way of uh, getting distracted is to watch uh, Danish soap operas series when when he's not in project. And he was like watch and watch, watch. And that day, his old love showed up. She's not an actress. Wow. She showed up in that particular episode he's never seen and as an actress being accused of murder. So she was on trial in that scene and, and he saw he couldn't believe it because he hasn't seen her in ten years. He she's not an actress. She was in a community with him and she he just exposed this this thing about her. And when he saw her on the screen, he knew it was Jesus saying, you know, you were living in the past. She has moved on. You can move on too. Don't live in your anger anymore. And when he got that message, he had a mystical experience. All the time and space disappeared in his mind. He felt free. And that was that, was that sin. But, you know, that was how, you know, it's not really our... Bodies are used, orchestrated by Jesus, just to bring bring the mind so close to the to the point where it can pop. But it, in the end, the healer is Jesus. You know, it's like okay, give it to me, then that's it. I yeah. Felt that, and something struck me about that in the teaching of how ego uses memory to hold you to the past, and spirit will say, "Give it to me. I'm going to bring you. I'm going to bring it all right here, right now. I'm right here with you always." Yeah. The whole mind is like it's right here. That's the turn because the thing about it is like with with Jeffrey and Susanna, they were saying there was an initial traction there. The the spirit uses everything the ego made to take you to this wholeness and to this beautiful freedom. And in the case with Soren, he had an infatuation with this woman. And he felt so embarrassed by it. But it was almost like a 10-year period, a 10-year itch, and it comes back around. And then he was infatuated with, with Francis. So it's like the same inroad. The spirit knows exactly what it's going to take to open things up. To start to move him out of isolation was an infatuation. But then the spirit knows it's going to go far, far beyond the infatuation. Because the more he gets into it, It's the undoing of the self-concept. It's the undoing of pride in filmmaking. It's the undoing in in the fear of talking. You know, he he was afraid of the transparency, and that's what shut it all down before, and he just wallowed in the embarrassment. 
This time the embarrassment comes up again, the infatuation gets used, but this time it's repeatedly, calmly, Francis saying, are you triggered? I sense you're triggered. What is it? Uh, and he, well, mumble, mumble a little bit. She just patiently waits, and then, um, then she would even sometimes speak his thoughts. You know, no, you you already think you're right. <laughs> you already think you're right. You know, and and he, and, and then he said, yeah, amateurs, <laughs> right? You know, he would acknowledge it. But you see how the, how gentle the spirit is using whatever the attraction, whatever the, even the infatuation. It's not like you think, oh, it's terrible. I, I'm not a good spiritual aspirant because I have an infatuation. You give it to the spirit and say, you know this difficulty I have with this or this conundrum or this, this obsession I have, but you use it to heal me. And that's the beauty of how gentle the spirit is. It'll take everything, it, whatever is necessary. And, and in the case of Soren, it was, it's been quite obvious. I mean, he kind of turned into the star when he, when we first premiered this over at the the A two L uh, event there in in at the monastery, I was in the back on a couch just watching the whole thing, and they beamed in Soren uh, on the screen from uh, from over in Spain. I think he was in Spain, and the people after they'd watched the movie, they felt Soren's heart. They felt so connected with Soren that it was almost like they were like. Soren, Soren, and then at the end, when when they were ready to sign off, I watched Soren, Soren. You know, I mean, oh my gosh! So oh, when we were in Holland, you know, he was on tech support, and I said, "Well, we had like 180 people there," and I said, "We're not going to show the movie till the very end because if we showed the movie at the beginning, you would have so many groupies uh, all around you, you would not even be able to do your work." on the tech team, and he'd be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but people couldn't recognize him. He is a different person. He lost all this weight. He actually was showing up, someone was talking about him, but not realizing he was actually there, because he just completely trans... Like, he told me, because every time I see him, he's a different person. I was like, Soren. He said, yeah, I don't need to protect anymore. I don't, I don't need to protect anymore. This... Just this letting, I'm not afraid of love anymore. So. Is he in love? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Oh, she should know about too. Our we had that was it a weekend retreat where Francis dared to go that way. Where apparently he was being, Soren was being interviewed uh, for some recording or something, and basically the the interviewer was saying. You know, well, what about, so you, you, you love Frances, and yes, I love her. Well, is Frances in a relationship? And uh, Soren said, yes, she is. She's in a relationship with uh, JP. And, and then the interviewer said, but are you in a relationship with Frances? And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> And I thought, and oh, he here came, we go. He came to me and he said, he said, I, I told, I told her. I mean, I said, you clarified, right? That relationship. What, it, what you mean? Yeah. And he said, yeah, love. I love. I. It, I said, oh, oh. clarified Sorry. it all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he said, but yeah, but this is so close because course is. A, he was so passionate about the pathway now because it's a real experience. He said it's so, it's through relationship. So, of course, we're in a relationship. I told her, of course, we're in a relationship. <laughs> and, and he said, I said, what, what is her reaction? And he said, she rolled her eyes and thinks, asking, what is that? <laughs> I said, well, it, it can be a little clear. <laughs> but it, 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 in a way, that's, that's how it feels, like, we did talk about that. It's kind of launched us into the quantum realm. There was only one way, one way place to go with that kind of thing. You either go down into like the the dark places of of what do you mean and what that, or you go into quantum, which which is what it's all about and always has been about. 
So that's what we did on the show. As soon as you brought it up, I thought, oh, here we go. We can only go quantum at this point. There is no, <laughs> there's no other angle to go here. a question or an observation when I was watching the movie with Soren <clears throat> that this infatuation with this other woman that his, he was in a space where his heart opened and he associated that with love and then when he was also in a space with, with you Francis and in the community there his heart opened again and it seemed like we can to me, we can call it infatuation, attraction, whatever, but it was a heart opening that got interpreted another way. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Because actually I asked Soren about that because he goes back and takes trips to Copenhagen. And I asked him, I said, did you ever meet her? Because he had all this feeling of embarrassment and then at some point of hatred and everything. He, after the movie and after these healing experiences, he says, oh yeah, I went back, I looked her up, I met her. And he said, I love you. And she said, I know. <laughs> and it was just what you would expect of that because he simply had lost the fear of expressing his love. And her response was, I know. And, and he said, and I've always loved you. She said, I know. I love you too. And it was just, it, it totally flowered from no fear or no sense of holding back. Yeah. I think that's that's a very good point because on this journey you you open your heart to the spirit so much everybody who come to your awareness be, brings this unified experience of love and connection and intimacy and it's only the label you put on and the meaning and or oh, projecting to the future and which box that that fits in but if you just like okay it's all your all your I, I withdraw all the meaning. I just let this collaboration. But y if you see it, it spirit orchestrated in such integrity, even with the, the rules and the morality of the world, the spirit is still saying, I know this realm. I know there's a lot of judgment. We are not going to try to bust the rules here, but I'm going to give you a unified love experience that you are not limited to this box or that box, the experience is going to be uni uni universal. So that's, that's exactly that. That was a lesson we all learned too, was, was that the spirits, depending on the location and the people and the culture and everything, the spirit will translate and use the symbols to take everyone into the agape love. But also, it's when, you, when the spirit gives you a symbol and you're supposed to use this symbol for spirit, you use it with integrity. You know, you don't take on symbols and then dismiss symbols, the very symbols that you've taken on. If you take on, like a symbol, for example, of marriage, there are certain things that, that there's an integrity and there's an honesty that goes on with using those symbols. The spirit can use different ones in different cultures. And we've had to do that over the years, you know, um, Back in the day of, of Jesus, you know, they basically, all the apostles and the women's corps, which kind of got written out of the Bible, but all of them were, were there in Galilee. So they didn't have immigration issues. Uh, now, for me, I'm just happy, and then these people come, 10 and 20, 30, 40 people and everything, and they're coming from all parts of the world. We we're talking about green cards and immigration. They come from all over, and so... We've had to be very prayerful in the use of all that because Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God's that was God's. He wasn't telling you to go around and overtly break the laws of the world. He was saying transcend them by going into your mind, into the law of love, that there's only one 
real law, and that's the law of love, because you were created by God, so therefore you're under, only under the, the laws of God. And when you transcend the other ones, you don't have to do it in flamboyant ways where you try to break uh, the laws. You basically follow the guidance, and Jesus can easily do it inside of the laws of the world. So at one point, um, we had a foundation, a nonprofit foundation, and there was a, a religious visa that was through that foundation, but when that ended and didn't come through, the church symbol came in. None of us actually were thinking we would start a church. Uh, that was not just not in our thinking. I mean, I was a mystic traveling on the world, going all over to ashrams and talks, and you know, what's the need of a church? But again, it's not my plan. It's, there's a bigger plan, so that came in, and that was helpful too in the use of bringing people together from different uh, countries so that we could live and work in, in projects together. But that took a lot of guidance as well to just follow. So it's the, it's the guided use of symbols that is really what we're talking about. We're not saying it's like a cookie-cutter approach where this symbol is for everyone. We're saying the symbols that you're given, you have to honor the use of those symbols for as long as they're needed. And eventually you will transcend them because it's, you have these vast mystical states of mind that, that go way beyond anything of time and space, which is our natural inheritance. But meanwhile, like we had some people recently that were part of our monastery and, and church symbol we've used and everything, and they just started, they love me, they love A Course in Miracles, they love the teachings, and they also like shamanism, and they also like psychedelics, and that psychedelics work really well with shamanism and don't work very well with the Christian <laughs> church. So they had to kind of come and say, this is important. There's a lot of people that are going through experiences with ayahuasca and, and different psychedelics that they need the mind training. And the Course in Miracles mind training is perfect for somebody who has had a glimpse but needs much more work in mind training and forgiveness. Because if you just go back, try to get that glimpse over and over that's not going to, to do it for you. So the Spirit blesses that, and they go their way, but then they're going to have to use the psychedelics with integrity, you know, like, and talk to any shaman. They'll say, yeah, this is not just psychedelics. There's a lot of mind training, a lot of preparation. There's ceremony. There's a huge context around these psychedelics. You don't just throw them in there and say, well, okay, you look like you're stoned there, but... I Hope, hope you do well there. Move on. <laughs> yeah, you know. So everybody is having to learn the same lesson. Like whatever symbols you're given by the Spirit, whatever they are, they could be anything, but just use them with integrity for as long as you need them, and then they will fall like scaffolding. They'll just uh, fall away. But that's a big part of guidance. You really have to really tune into that guidance to, to use them with that, I mean, Jeffrey's the twelve steps have been so helpful for you, and and the course is very helpful for you. And now I think, you know, it's like you're quite versatile. Where people who come through the twelve steps or the course, you can say, oh yeah, I can relate totally with what you're doing, and the spirit will use those experiences to help you be like a wise counselor for them, and. And that's good. And it's better than thinking, oh, okay, what have I got to learn? A bunch of new skills. Do I have to learn circular breathing? Do I have to learn postures? Do I have to learn, you know, movement of energy and all these things? In my case, I did I know Tai Chi? No. Did I you know yoga? No. Tennis? Yes. Uh, basketball? Yes. Uh, but I did spirit taught me how to go out on a tennis court and use it as like a movement meditation without keeping score and just I had a partner who was into Kriya Yoga and Yogananda and I was into the course and we would get into mystical states of complete non-judgment through the tennis not through Tai Chi, not through different types, we, the spirit used exactly what we were interested in and then took it and said, now give it to me, guys. Uh, this is going to have to go a lot higher than trying to compete or win a tournament. Uh, I've got a much higher purpose for your tennis skills. 
And, and I find that everything in my life has gone that way where Jesus loves us so much, he uses the things we're already interested in, the things we already have skills in, and he will channelize all these things in one direction to unify our mind. So that way we don't have to start to think in compartmental things, like, oh, I've got to give up this, and, well, this isn't spiritual, so I need to give up that. I mean, initially people could have told me, you know, well, tennis is definitely not spiritual. Uh, but Tai Chi is. Well, Jesus to Jesus, no, they weren't any different. He could use them both. And, and he knew I was more interested in, <laughs> in the tennis than the Tai Chi. So that's, that's exactly how it works. Yeah. So this is reminding me, David, that I've heard you say before, uh, maybe this is not the exact words, but that our attraction and our repulsion are places to look that there's something to learn. So we've had a lot of conversation about the attraction, but also it seems like that something that we're repulsed by is um, a place to look because somehow it's triggering us that there's something to pay attention to. Yeah, I can give you a practical example from my life, how that worked. This this man, Don, who was into tennis, um, we both started to use our love of tennis to use this. We called it TPT, transpersonal tennis. Uh, we would go out in the court and our skill level would go up and we'd get more still. But one time, um, and Don, was heavy, he came from Eastern philosophies and everything, and he was saying, you know, well, let's... We experimented with vegetarianism, like a lot of people do, experiment with diet and everything. At the time, we were both uh, not eating meat. We were just following more of a vegetarian diet. And, uh, and he called me one day, and he said, I found something in the paper, David, because we were simple mystics, uh, not really having a lot of funds or jobs and things. He said, it's a, it's a study at a hospital where... They're only accepting vegetarians, and they'll pay you <laughs> to go and drain, drain your blood and test a part of this uh, kind of thing. They're testing something out, and so you have to go for, I don't know, a week and a half or something, and progressively they take your blood more and more and more and more, uh, and then at the end of the study you get paid. And he said, let's do it. So... I remember when I had gone for a tonsillectomy when I was in maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13, that when they went to draw the blood, I had a repulsion to the, <laughs> to the blood coming out. I was like looking, and this is my blood. <laughs> and I got, I got really lightheaded and white all immediately. And, I, and they brought in, the <laughs> you know, to revive me and everything. So when... Don said, let's do this study where they're going to, not just once, but they're going to progressively take it over like a week and a half or something. I just thought, oh, I've got a real repulsion to this. I think Jesus <laughs> probably used this because I've got some kind of issue with blood <laughs> coming out of this body. Uh, so uh, we went in and they started off kind of slow, but as it progressively went on, they... They had to have somebody coming and looking, tap, tap, tapping, and finding a vein and doing this thing. And I'm going through all this and praying and praying. And, and this was the case of repulsion where I was like, I need to forgive this because I've got some kind of past association. And lesson number two from the Course is I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. So I've got some kind of association with this blood. Anyway, it goes to the final day and... My arm looked like like, a, like I had the arm of a junkie. I mean, I was just there were just here's somebody who didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs and everything. And I'm like, oh, my mom would have a fit if she saw. That. She'd be like, where did I go wrong? <laughs> but they got there, and it's kind of a little bruised, and you know, and they were having difficulty. And then there was one. Okay, one more last draw, and and I and the assistant that came in, I could see the fear on her face uh, when she walked in the door. Like she had 
of fear written all over her face. And she was the one to take the blood. And they were having trouble finding the thing. So I'm sitting there, and she's like, whack, whack. And I, for somebody who's got an issue with <laughs> blood, this is like, and I'm like thinking, Jesus. And, and she's doing it. And finally, she just bursts into tears, and she runs out of the room. And then they send in a, like a doctor <laughs> to kind of do the final one. He comes in and he does it to me. So I'm sitting there that afternoon and I'm laying in the bed just relaxing and I'm just in prayer with Jesus and I'm saying, wow, this is really, you are taking this repulsion I have around blood and you are really helping me heal all my associations around. Thank you so much. And he's like, oh, it's almost like a revolver. One more one more task here, one more gift. And it was like, and I saw her walk, the woman who had tried to do it, walk through and kind of glance in nervously and walk by. It was almost like she was coming to apologize, but she felt so bad about it that she just would look in the room and she would go by. Then she'd go by again, I'd see her look in. And Jesus was like, here, I'm sending her to you. You need to offer a blessing. So finally, when she was there, I said, oh, come on in, come on in. And so she came over, and she's like trying to stammer and apologize for the whole thing. And Jesus had me say, no, no, let me give you a hug. You don't know how helpful (laughs) you were to me. I had to express all the gratitude for facing this repulsion with this woman because it was my way of offering the miracle. Like, no, you played your part Actually, perfectly. You didn't do anything wrong. It was all there for me to release this in my mind. And so she, oh, her shoulders came down and she relaxed and she could feel the love. We both, we both could feel the love. But that's just like an example where, where you know there's like some kind of a repulsion. When my friend said, here's a study, they're just going to have to draw blood for like a week and a half. And right away I, I, I went, oh, this is going right at... A repulsion, but I didn't uh, shy away from it. I actually felt like, no, I need to. F- there's something I need to face and forgive here, and and I think we do get those opportunities. We get a lot of them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Francis. Um, um, Soren, I think his name was. Um, it's at the beginning he was talking about that you guys were amateurs, and um, I'm not sure if he was only um, doing the sound, but it, so- it sounded like he wanted to make some decisions himself, or he wanted to tell you guys how to do something. I don't know if it's just the sound or if it's other things. Um, but what I was wondering was, once the movie was finished, did he have a better, did he say anything about understanding the way that you actually did it, like, which I guess was different than how he would have done it? Yeah, that that particular scene was uh, because we, the camera person, that's um, Raphael, who is the son of the famous cinematographer, he, but he is, Raphael is inexperienced, so he put the person in the wrong side of the camera. Apparently, there's a rule which way you put the face. And Soren wants to correct the cameraman, and I stopped him. I said, just focus on the sound. Let the cameraman do what they have to do. And so he was very angry. But then what happened was after we shot the whole 30 days, um, at the end, he had so much healing and forgiveness. He was so happy he left he, within two months, he did a movie. He took the footage. He, I gave him a copy of the footage. I keep a copy of the footage. He took it to Denmark, and within two months, he sent me, he said, I, f- I made a movie. And his, his version, his narration, his, his way, it was, it was very sweet, very beautiful, but it's not, <laughs> it's not the movie that I had envisioned. So when he gave me the the movie he was really happy and, and looking forward to my response and he came back to Utah and presented the movie and I watched it and he was like what do you think I said no 
And he's like, where are you going to approve of me? <laughs> so I said, well, let's, let's, let's do it together. Let's really pray about what's going to happen. But it, in the end, it took almost two years in the process for me and you know, with very much collaboration with him as well to, to finish the final thing. And, and it's not how he envisioned, but he is a huge star in this version. And he really see that, wow, he, he, he did mention, he said, uh, this is not how I envisioned, but it's so much more than what I have asked for. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to share one other thing that Soren actually came just to work on the movie, and he stayed. He still lives with us after three years, so he he has come into something much better than a movie. <laughs> yeah, the the healing was way beyond just a movie because when he came back, he said, "Okay, then we, you know, the version he made within two months is not it." So we said, "Let's let's continue working on the." The editing process, and the editing process is nothing about real editing. It's really about me finding the way, because there was still a lot of the the conflicting goals. You know, in the end, I realized that talking about this is not about an end result. But when we reached the point of putting it together, there were a lot of. Um, thoughts and people reflect it's not clear enough people wouldn't understand and then I started to think yeah how do we make it clear but the moment my thinking goes that way the joy went so there was no middle ground for me the middle it's like you you work for end project product for someone else or you're working for your enlightenment with Jesus for present peace like these two goals become so obviously different for me, and I have to choose one. And based on the goal I choose, I make a decision. So the decision constantly is, okay, I'm not going to worry about the end result. Okay, I'm not going to worry about how people think. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it's not making sense. It's like letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. And for Soren, it's like a very much... So, yeah, you're talking about the foul corruption. Yeah, there was... There were so many lessons, even it was with, like with 300 hours of footage, and you're co- going to come down to one hour and 20 minutes. That's an enormous editing process. And again, Francis is saying, not for this audience or that audience. It's like, Jesus, what do you want in your movie is basically what the healing, where the joy comes in, is putting everything under Christ's control, not just the scribing, the shooting, the filming, now the editing the distribution, we're here with you instead of at, at a film festival. We're here with you in Sundance. Is it a film festival? Well, yeah, it's our own <laughs> Hallelujah Film Festival, but it's not on the books. It's not an official one. But there came a point in the editing where where the entire file yeah. became it was, uh, corrupted. It was after two years, after I finished, like after this long journey of finding, finding, sorting out the goal and letting go and really make all the decisions about right now, about right now, whether I feel Jesus in my heart now and choose the picture based on that. Then it's all done after two years, and we're going to take it to Portugal to colorize. Um, Then Sora and I were going to take the the footage in a hard drive that I can travel on plane. And then when we moved it to the hard drive, Suddenly, we realized we couldn't open the file anymore. And first, it was just he then realized I couldn't open it, and neither of us could, can open the file anymore. So he called Apple and sent the whole file to Apple to say, well, we don't know what's going on, but neither of us could open it anymore. And Apple said, give, give us three days to analyze the file. So within the three days, um, Soren just said to me, he said, you know, I just feel... Because the way he helped me editing, there are certain clusters. There was so many layers of the footage. You open one layer, is another layer, is another layer, is another layer. He said it just look. It feels like my mind. It was so complicated. Why don't I just simplify this whole thing to get it down to the most surface level? There's no, you know, layered buried upon layers. I just bring it all to the surface. 
I said, well, you, you do what you have to do. We don't know whether we can recover anything. So three days later, Apple came, called back and said, unfortunately, your file is corrupted. It's unrecoverable. So it's all gone. And we were like, oh, wow, it's really not about an end product. After two, <laughs> after <laughs> two about, years, boom. Talking <laughs> about letting go. Yeah, it's a Sand Mandela, and it's not just... So we thought, okay. And on the same day when Apple told me that Soren finished the clearing up, and we, we opened it again. It, it's, that's the file you're watching now. We have no idea... How was the problem on the physical level? It's all mind. It's all mind. And we accept the miracle. We're not like, oh, how did that happen? It doesn't make sense. No, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and the backstories go on and on and on around behind the movie because there was also backstories about uh, a company in Mexico that they were working with and and... And Francis would go in there and, and explain things and had a vision, really, a guided vision for the movie. And then there would be technicians that would be working on the film that for some reason, like JP was even saying, they don't seem to be respecting you. They're looking at you as like this tiny Asian woman. They know the way, you don't, and you need to pipe down and listen and let them take over the project because they're the technicians. And uh, Svava was uh, was filming was was actually recording an album. She was talking to me about the same thing. She'd go into the studio. She was losing the project to the men uh, who would, who were supposed to be working for them. So JP and I were sitting there, and because Francis is talking a lot to JP, giving him an earful about what these guys are doing to her movie, and Svava's giving me an earful about what these guys are doing to her her album. And finally, I said, "Wait a minute." You're the client, you know, they're the clients, you're the ones that are paying them. So you need to be very direct and tell them this is the contract, this is what you promised, these are the deliverables, this is what you promised, you need to follow through. And then if they do say yes to that, then you continue with them. If not, you've got to find, find somebody else who can let you carry your vision forward. You can't compromise your vision for the movie, for the album. And Svava wrote a really direct email, and she read it to me. She said, should I read it to you? I said, yeah. She said, I can't send that. I said, yes, you can. You're, you're paying them. That's, <laughs> that's exactly what you tell these guys. And then they, they came around. To an extent, um, there was miracles even with Francis with these, because they had to shift. She had to let them go for a part of it and... and send it to uh, Portugal to be completed. But then there's the story of Portugal because they, they, they put the film, after they recovered the file, that miraculously they put it on two hard drives and they sent it across to Portugal for the Portuguese team to work on it. It got caught up in customs where the customs received both hard drives and would not release the hard drives. They... They're still there. They've been, they were captured by the Portuguese customs, including a credit card on file with a fine, paying a fine every day. And why would they do this? You tell the rest yeah. of the story. If you can imagine, <laughs> after this two and a half years of... It's really not like a, a rosy... And it was one after the next, after the next, after the next. Then finally we, we shipped this off the day before I flew to Japan. I cannot continue working on it anymore. I went to Japan. This Portuguese team only has a week. They are free. They are completely booked out because the Cannes Festival, they have only a week. So we send the file 10 days before their opening. And then by the 10th day, I got notice from Susanna the the, the hard drive is still not arrived, and these guys, they're waiting. And after this week, they're, they're, they're not going to work with us anymore. So I was like, what's the reason? They keep going to the customs, and th then in the end, they told us, okay, it's because we, we own tax to the government, and the immigration is not going to release the hard drive until we pay the tax. 
large amount of tax. It is a lot the company of money. That was doing it. And the company basically said to, to us, we're not paying the tax. So we were like, is the, is the day you're supposed to start working on our film and the, the hard drive is caught and they're definitely not going to pay the tax because it's a lot. And the government is not going to relieve. Release. Like a hijacking. It's a hijacking. Hard, now <laughs> and now then, it's been hijacked. It's in the Portuguese <laughs> customs department. Yeah. After all that, after overcoming corrupt file. And yeah, so <laughs> I was in Japan and doing gatherings and Sudan. I was in Utah and Jeffrey were there and then we were on the, on the phone call and we were like, we really don't know what to do. So let's just pray together because that's how we solve all our problems so far with everything. So let's just pray. So I prayed. I said, what is this for, Jesus? What is this about? And then I heard in my mind, it's for a miracle. So I said, oh, that's great. So I called Susanna back. I said, it's for a miracle. So we were like, let's celebrate that for no reason. <laughs> Nothing has shifted. <laughs> we were just <laughs> celebrating in mind, really. That's, you know, talking about happy for no real reason. We just want to be in that happiness. We don't want to be all worried about problems. But um, then we just started to think, why don't we um, upload the file through the internet and we, we'll see how, how long it takes. And that was a miracle because we thought the file was so large. That's why we split in two hard drives. It was terabytes of files. But then when we um, compressed the file, it took like an hour to compress. It was so quick. And it got sent through the internet within three days. And the the firm in Portugal finished within three days. It was like a total miracle. Jesus arranged time and space. It was like nothing was a real limitation. If we don't buy into, that is a problem. So that's how the whole thing got resolved. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> It's like being used, we, we, can't direct, we can't direct the form. All you have to do is just keep praying, receive, follow. Pray, receive, follow. And not get caught up into the, the why or the what for or this or that. Because the joy comes from the listening and the following. And in the end, you know, it's kind of like if you listen and follow... Jesus is not looking for any kind of an outcome and form anyway because he knows it's not real. He's just using the form as a backdrop for the listen and follow. Because once you make that connection, that was what it was all for anyway, the vertical connection with spirit. It wasn't about making something in the world. So the movie ended up being, and still is, uh, once we got through filming, editing, production colorization and all this, and now we got into distribution, we're finding that Jesus' distribution plan, you're all a part of it, <laughs> by the way, is different from the concepts of distributing a film in a regular way. We still may get into a film festival where Sundance, um, we're still waiting to hear back from them, but, but actually it's with all of you going through this beautiful healing together that that's the way Jesus is distributing his, his film. I just want to share, because I, I already shared with you, A Horrible Old Heart, the, the song um, at the beginning of the piano and the violin, and how um, poignant that is for me, and how recently I've been pulled into Arbo Old Heart's music and Ludovico Ainaldi's piano music, which is very subtle, but it's very profound, and pulling my mind into the silence and the stillness, and I'm realizing the more subtle, the more profound it really is, so I'm pulled into that piece early on and the tears are just flowing because I'm just picking up the art of this film as whoa this is this is for me right now and then it, when the credits are rolling I'm, I'm, I'm picking up the information of Arvo Park and so last night I, I'm, I'm looking up Arvo Ar or actually it's this morning I'm, my mind is on fire with this stuff and I'm just keeping focus and I'm looking up you know I know Arvo Park oh let me find this song so I found the song and it's um Spiegel in Spiegel is the name of the song. Beautiful, subtle piece, but the 
back story to that song is opens up to this more subtleties of, uh, of the miracle for me. Well, in the end, more of okay, this is this 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 movie is my movie. This was meant for me. This land is your land. This land is my land. Now this movie is my movie. This is your movie. But that subtlety of Arvo Park and, and his story and him writing mirror and what Spiegel in Spiegel means is um, the mirrors in the mirror. And, and I'm like, whoa, what great selection, Holy Spirit, through the Francis and J.P. and the subtleties for my movie and the healing of who and, and the, the, the beauty of this film in, in a non-produced way speaks volumes. And that's that's really cool because it's it's you, you, it's there. It's there if you're paying attention and being pulled into it, just like the course of nature. It's like, whoa, didn't see that part. Yeah, it was there. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, I just want to see if you can speak on this because it's it keeps coming up too in what you're saying now. This kind of um I feel like I have this kind of fear of the specificity of I almost don't even want to pray. Like, I don't want to say anything <laughs> specific. I don't want to ask anything specific. I don't want to want anything specific. And I almost, I, I do feel like, I, I noticed a couple of days ago in anticipation of coming here, I just kind of went, oh, I'm hiding, like, <laughs> you know, and it was exciting, because I was like, oh, man, I'm hiding, I've been hiding. But it's just, I'm a little confused. Yeah, I'm a lot confused. This thing has happened to me, it's been happening for a while, it's the most beautiful thing. Like this light comes up over the world, and the whole world is light, and it's so beautiful. <laughs> and I can even sometimes watch it go away and bring it back up, like on purpose. And I can see everything. But it, and those things, and I have had a, like a lot of, like I've had an experience being really well located and I was like, where am I? Like, I mean, I was back here. But I feel like this is grace, like this very quiet, secret grace, <laughs> like it's a secret. <laughs> so I'm so grateful for the grace. It's almost like I don't want to, I can't move. I don't want to touch it. And then I feel like what I do is allow myself, like, just like right now, uh, I'm a sing, I'm a lead singer, but in someone else's band. Like, perfect. I have to take no responsibility. But now I'm feeling this squeeze. Like, I want to sing my own songs. Even those songs I co-wrote, some of them I really believe in, but some I don't. I'm like, oh, it's not really what I want to say. But I am, I'm so afraid to take a step, and so afraid to, to kind of to do like you, Francis. But I see now, I see what it is. You had guidance, you had strength to let you be the boss. To let you say, I'm sorry, this is the way, this is my vision for it. And I'm in a band with eight guys, and I'm good, I'm strong, and I, and I do have like some spiritual strength that I can sometimes make really happen, you know. And I can get, I can help and get sort of everyone in the right, in a good position, and we can make the thing, and we did this, I just recorded a song, and Still, it was, and what we ended up with was great, and I love it. But God, it was like, what would it be like to, to, uh, to really, actually, really, just with freedom, just really, like I feel like I don't really press my. What would it be like to really? I don't even. 
And I see that my ego, my mind has whipped up so much nonsense about being afraid of it that I'm not even afraid of it anymore, even as I'm afraid. I'm like, I have places to be afraid now. But I don't hear guidance. And this is like the message to me over so much the last week. Guidance. And I'm, that's my view. Struggle, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't even know what I'm asking. I think like this, I have these dumb questions. It's like, can I just get by with seeing light? Do I not have to ask Jesus? Because I don't want to. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful because those mystical experiences and those light experiences are are just showing you where this is all heading. And that is precisely what the mind, the ego is a fear, a strong fear of that. Even with guidance, the ego is like, it's it's not too, too f afraid by, I am with you always, even to the end of time, and just things that have been repeated over and over for the centuries. But the ego doesn't want you to have that specificity because it's terrified of of losing its identity. It's almost like there's a sacrifice idea, like if you hear the guidance specifically and you follow that guidance specifically, then that's the end of me, the ego is saying. So have your light experiences every once in a while, but don't you dare uh, listen and follow. But it's beautiful too that you're in, in a situation where it sounds like it's it's always step by step where we build our confidence and our strength in the spirit. We have to build, we have to be convinced by the spirit that, that we're loved, that it's okay. And we're given these opportunities. Uh, one of the things that we showed, uh, Francis and I showed the movie yesterday uh, over in Holland, and it's on Spreaker. I think you can go and look it up. But it, when the main character goes through this kind of a flash, like this Y2K kind of flash, the electricity goes out for the whole world, and then he's aware of all these Beatles songs, but the rest of the world seems to have forgotten the Beatles. And so he has like this secret inside, like he knows all the Beatles songs, and nobody else does. And he's like shocked that nobody else knows of the Beatles. But the whole thing is a powerful metaphor for him having to come in contact with the confidence to let that love, the Beatles songs, all those great songs, shine through for the world, even though he has embarrassment, he feels like it's a big secret, you know, even when people say, wow, that's an amazing song, he is dealing with his own fear and his own issues around letting these amazing Beatles songs come through. And, and it's a great movie because that's where you're at. I think you just have to take those step by step. You just have to keep tuning in, building your confidence with the Spirit. And as you do, the Spirit will bring it to the point where it's like you're collaborating with the Spirit, with that light. And then you have less and less need to compromise with the world or with a band. Like Frances with Soren, there was all kinds of different things coming at her, but she had to, to really go within to really follow what Jesus wanted. And they're going to go through the same experience. You're just going to build your confidence, build your confidence. And it's not unusual what you're sharing. I've heard this many, many people, they're afraid of the specificity of the guidance. You know, it's all right. We have one friend, uh, who Seema, who was a, a medical doctor, and she was watching one of our online retreats, and it just got so mystical during the online retreat that she thought, I'm just going to, like, take notes, because this is so profound. So she started quickly taking the notes, and then all of a sudden... It was almost like it took over. It just started taking the notes. She was like watching the notes being taken. And that scared her. <laughs> because she thought it was Seema taking the notes. And all of a sudden... And then she started to realize that her calling in life is not to be a medical doctor or a life coach. But she wants to write stories. 
And I have a friend in prison, Dale, who's studying the Course in my teachings and having these huge breakthroughs. She wants to write his story out. She wants to write inspiring stories. At this stage of her life, she's starting to realize she has a calling to be a storyteller. It's very different from her previous life of a medical doctor. And it scares her because there's a feeling of almost like losing a control. And you're more on the edge where you're having these light experiences and when you're in those, it, there's nothing more exquisite. It's total grace. And you do, you can move towards that. It's not like in the end you have a, an earthly mission that takes priority over the, going to the light. In the end, Jesus will, Spirit will instruct you to use your gift in a way that blesses so many through your gift and, and takes you more gently into that light, you know, like where you start to feel worthy of that light. Because all of us have felt unworthy when we have those kind of experiences, you know, it's like, what just happened? And, but you're, these sounds like they happen pretty regularly for you. Yeah. I think I think you activated Siri. <laughs> I'm having trouble with connection. <laughs> you said horror, and it went. I'm having trouble with connection. <laughs> that's it right there. That that's pretty uh, pretty strong. Yeah, but we're with you. You know, we we're with you in this. We I feel like when we come together, you know, we are lifelong supporters of each other. We are lifelong mighty companions and. We all have the same goal, is to go to the light. And we just are learning the nuances and building the confidence and the trust. And so that's what you're doing. You're just saying, I was afraid, but here it is. I'm going to spill the beans. <laughs> Even Siri supporting you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wasn't going to speak about this, but something is telling me I should. And um, I have been in the Course since 1993, uh, not as committed, but was very much in it from the very beginning in the sense that when I had heard that this world wasn't real, I wanted to have a party because I always, deep down inside, always knew that. And I was with a very good friend and when we went out, we were with Ken Wapnick, and we were at one of his uh, retreats. And we went outside, and she cried, and I wanted to have a party. She really had a hard time with it. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is something I know. Okay? But I went on to suffer for many, many years with ego. And then when I came to Sedona... I found a group, and I, it started out with Course in Miracles. And I really was committed every time. I read the book every day. And um, I took notes. And um, I asked for help from Spirit many times. And I really felt a lot of joy. And I knew I was healing something, a relationship. So um, that continued. And it's still continuing. Uh, and this film was very interesting because it brought up some of the things that I never would have thought of, especially with Francis, the cook. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it was very interesting how the, the team or the woman who spoke to Francis when she had all that resistance, and um, it was like, Jesus speaking through her because she was so patient and, and, and Francis was so resistant at the beginning and I was just feeling Jesus in there because the, when, when, she was, when that woman was talking, I said, well, you can leave. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I, under, I know what you're saying. And then <coughs> I, something happened, something changed 
And then Frances, you see her later on. You see her walking to her car, and then you see her, you figure she's going to go, you know? And um, then the next thing, the next scene is she's staying, you know? And then I ha I, tears came to my eyes because um, I knew she was in this, I think she even mentioned it, abandonment. She felt abandoned uh, by, you know, not being the center, um, which I think is so... <laughs> I, I never even realized that I could do that, too. And I've done it, you know, and felt that abandonment in different areas of my life. So it was like a realization. I said, okay, yeah, that's, that's a healing that she was going through. And um, I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am that I have committed myself to the course again. But I'm going to say that I went on to the course of love. And I was telling Lynn that this is no accident that I'm here because there was something coming up for me. And when you spoke about it, I wanted to, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm hearing this. It was my feelings about when I was listening to all of us speak in the course of love that something was coming up that didn't feel right, and it was taking form and bringing it to spirit, but keeping it together. And everybody was like, on, um, you know, and this is where I don't know how to put I didn't want to be judgmental, but I was hearing something that I'm trying so hard to get rid of is the form and being here in spirit and having that, you know, God-like up and down uh, parallel, not, not this way anymore. So when Lynn came into the group for a while and, we spo and she told me about you, I went right to the internet and got all your books and started to listen to you on the uh, YouTube. And I said, oh my gosh, this is where I belong. I belong indefinitely with the course. And I, I couldn't wait to get here for the retreat. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I've, I've been reading your book, and I've been, but it, you know, the thing I want to say here is the clarity. There is such a clarity, and I've been to many groups that come through you at this time. And um, it brings tears to my eyes. It really does. But I have, this is the guilt. I have to bring it up that w I don't want to be listening to the course of love anymore. But is it Jesus that I'm listening to? Because I was very devoted and taking down all of what was being said. I did the 40 days and the whole bit. Not finished yet. But I don't want to be there anymore. You know? I feel like um, it's not my truth that's coming through my heart. You know, I feel my heart has been opened in the course of miracles. And it's not that my heart hasn't been open in the course of love, and everybody is devoted uh, that, uh, that's doing that book. But I don't think I have to be there anymore. So yeah, it's saying. like a discernment thing. Like many years ago, um, after I came more and more in contact, just used the course so directly, um, I had people showing up and wanting to say, I'm going to be your student and all these different things. And um, But they said, the course is so deep. It's just, it, sometimes it flies over over my awareness. I need more parables. I need more more examples. Like, if there's one really good principle, can I have like, 30 examples to, to really anchor it so I can go, that, that, that's it, I got it. On the 30th one, <laughs> whatever that was, I got it. And so I actually, some of you know of the Urantia book. I actually used the last section of the Urantia book, which is the life and teachings of Jesus, to pull parables for the students to show them these course principles in action so that they could relate a little bit better. Now with, um, like for example, conversations with God, if you, if you have a deep enough discernment, you can go in and you can see 
that there's still dualistic um, components that are part of conversation with God. It's a great pathway. I mean, many people go to conversations with God after they've been in formal religion and they're starting to burn out to the formal religion and they go, wait a minute, conversations with God? My priest never said I could have conversations with God. They said conversations with the, the, the priest or with, with, with a nun, but not with, with God. So it's a stepping stone. And, and a course of love is definitely a stepping stone. There are people that will come to it, and it'll start to resonate. And, and the course is extremely deep, but there are many, many things. That, and so when people would hear me even mention the Urantia book, I would get floods of email as saying, should I study A Course in Miracles and... Uh, the Urantia book, and I'd say, no, if you've been in the course for a while, that's just going to mess you up <laughs> in a big way, because, again, the Urantia book is more of a cosmology of, of everything. It's more of a stepping stone. It, people can pass through it towards the course. But the problem was, was saying that the course of love was an extension of A Course in Miracles. It's, it's not an extension. It's... It, it, doesn't have that purity of of bringing the illusions to the truth. And there's a woman that I know whose name is Emmanuel, where she has spent hundreds of hours with A Course in Miracles and A Course of Love side by side, and she's going to write a book <laughs> on the discernment between the two. She actually, when I first met her out in California at a conference, I said, oh, that sounds... I'm, I'm so glad that you're taking the time to do this. Because Gary Renard will make comments on this. I'll make comments on this. Her husband, Bob Rosenthal, who's the president, co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace, he'll make comments. But it's actually Emmanuel who's going to take the time to put it side by side and show the discernment of, of the two. And I... I, I think I'm going to end up doing uh, this coming year. I'm going to have Bob and Emmanuel on. We're going to just going to start to go. There's so many people that are working with it. We're going to talk about all the discernments because uh, Emmanuel is very, very well versed. She's spent a lot of time in this. So your feelings, I think, are just very strong, intuitive feelings of what will save time for you. Jesus is not big on delay. He says. Uh, Delay is unknown in eternity and tragic in time. So Jesus is not a big fan of delay. <laughs> and when you try to mix the metaphysics, uh, that's when you get into this composite thing, that's where the delay enters. If you take those pure metaphysics and you really apply them with, with great sincerity and, and transfer of training, you don't make exceptions, that's how you move, accelerate you know, into the awakening. So, yeah, it's beautiful. You, you're very intuitive. You've been prompted. And, yeah, that's why it was kept saying, speak up, speak I it up. He, yeah, he kept on saying that. I was going to talk about something else. And, no, 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 go back to that because that's where it's at for you right now. And I am so, um, I don't know, I can't, it's like a confirmation. And I came here to confirm and now I feel like, oh wow, I'm right. I'm right where I'm supposed to be, and I have to go with this. And I'm very happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking that up. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to be flying out of here in just a few minutes to beat the dark. I can't drive in the dark, so uh, I just want every one of you to know. Uh, What's your name again? Steven? Yes, so. Steve. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thank you. She told me yeah, a while ago that I got what I got at here, even though my hearing was, uh, was interruptive and everything. So, but I did get what I needed here today. I knew that was going to happen, but not as bad as it was. I got to ask you something. They have a, they, people like me, they have these uh, things. Beautiful. Be open to that. So oh, I was certainly. Here, I was asking the Holy Spirit, certainly. what can I do 
stay up and see, hear more of this, because I know I lost a lot of good things, but I got what I needed. It's Certainly, Jeff. That okay. would be our honor to, he told me to, ask to you, use that. So. Well, we would love that. Yeah. I, we love all so. kinds of technology, that anything yeah. that would make you hear it clearer, yeah. I would love to put yeah. that on the microphone. We'll put it on all of our microphones. And, <laughs> um, but uh, I had been in the... I just talked to Jeffrey. Thank you for... He, he, he listened to me when we were doing this exercise over here, I just didn't get it. I didn't, and he jumped in there. Thank you for uh, helping me. He has a big help, okay? Because I was in 15 years on doing the course, and then I dropped it for five years, and uh, the Holy Spirit just wooed me back into it a few weeks ago. And uh, had two things, fear, and uh, I'll just say this quickly, and relationships are the things we're going to get rid of first. And so I said, do you want to start from the uh, from number page number one? And thought, he said, no, just open it up. I'll guide you to it. The first thing I opened up was relationships, <laughs> all of that. And I, when I read, read this, it, it, um, it said that, that um, the relationships, the special relations, uh, love relations, is the biggest mistake. I said, what? <laughs> That's what I've, fly, I've thrived, thrived on all my life because I, I like uh, uh, things like that with women and, uh, and date and, and do that. It's taking the time. And two weeks into study, every, every time I turned the page, it was again, it kept coming up. And then I get here and it's here. But two weeks ago, uh, it dropped off of me. Just all of a sudden, because when I saw some woman I liked, I get all you know that that sin, that, uh, that uh, feeling on you. It's gone, totally. I don't have to to worry about that anymore, because I know what I want in a relationship right now. And I told God, I want you to be my special love uh, really, really person. That's it. So thank you, everybody. I've been saving this. I read this the other day, and I'm so happy. To you, I'm going to say, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Because it said, every time I bless somebody, it will take your errors and correct all those errors. So I started blessing everybody. And I, 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 some of these things, after all those years of studying, I, I'm, I'm opening up. I'm in love with the Course. And to me, I heard you this afternoon, I think this is the only way out of here, is with the Course. It, it, it is so practical, and it makes so much sense, even more than it ever has now. So anyway, thank you. I'll be back. And um, I don't know. I just, I, I just got a renewal. That's all it is. I'm really... Love I, you, I, Jeff. And I've talked, Love you. I've talked to... Um, Jason a lot too and and he and I are getting good conversations too so I'm back thank you thank you oh we love you and have a safe trip home we get home good while well, it's nice and light <laughs> uh, David would you comment about the um, there's a a book online called uh, New Covenant, and they have uh, online meetings. And I've attended some, and I I think it's beneficial. But I wanted to hear what your you know opinion of it was. Well, I think that anything that that helps you on a daily basis that of facing any denials of of love or denials of Jesus in a very direct way is good. Also, um, I think it takes such patience and it takes such steadfast devotion to transfer the training that, um, that any time I hear words like shortcut or, or things like that, you know, it's the, the proof is always that you shall know them by their fruits and and I feel like if you go at it with great sincerity, it's really dependent on whatever you're working with. It's dependent on your sincerity and your willingness uh, to really 
bring the effect. So it's not so much trying to evaluate things. Even, like I was saying, Course of Love will be a, a pathway for, for many in the entry way. And then as you work with the Course, um, I feel like if it, if it helps you and benefits you on a daily basis, it can be helpful. But I, I, I'm cautious of, of places. Over the years, I've, I've been around the world many times, and sometimes I, I hear things that are called like shortcuts. This, this is the fast track. This is the shortcut to God. And you just have to be very discerning about that. I know at the beginning when they started, they all were dressing in white, and I've seen this before, where a group comes together, they dress in white, and they've got the shortcut to God and everything, and then I just watch. <laughs> you know, from a distance, I just, well, you know, we shall see. <laughs> I'm kind of like the, you know, the, those in the East, we shall see. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think... You know, my devotion with the Course and bringing the illusions to the truth, if you stay with the core of that and you really use that in your practice, that's, the, that's what's beneficial. Anything that supports you in that, I, I think, uh, is helpful. Yes, we've got a couple. Anthony and... Beautiful. And Anthony's right behind you, too. He wants to... week about how he was into you in the sense of all this this love for you, he loved you, and then you mentioned you had the student to uh, JP, and you said you felt love for Soren, you did this kind of sort of, that, you know, you deserve to feel that feeling. And so when I, I kind of knew a little bit about the movie, and so when I watched last night, like really anticipating, okay, Soren, he's like my man, I'm going to like, <laughs> he's going to get me through this like unrequited stuff that I'm going through and what I realized last night when I watched it I was like afterwards I broke down in tears it's almost like my my um, and you talk about how we put love in a box and how we have to see it a certain way my self concept I just saw how strong it is when it comes to how love has to look and even afterwards I saw Soren and he was like as a Japanese standard and they kind of even so it's like you have your I saw the pain you guys went through and it's like it do, it's so hard but it's like there's so much brainwashing, I think, around still like that relationship needs to look like this intimacy and this touch and we all long for it. So even in that, I saw Soren, it's like he was in his room and he was all alone. And I, it's almost like I had this projection of him, you're such a loser, right? And, uh, and I could see my judgments about myself. And it's like I, I can tell that he's unwinding because I can see like Groundhog Day and 222, like all these patterns keep coming up and going up. It's not out there and I'm creating it. But at the same time, it's like that next, it feels, it's like, it doesn't seem like a miracle. Though, though I see miracles because if it's not called running into Lynn two months ago, this course doesn't, doesn't happen. So I can see the, the, how the miracle that's created here right now, but at the same time, personally, it's like the pain that's coming up is like, I don't think I've been through so many like dark nights where I just see like bleak black, like bottomless, like almost like hell as I have in the last few months. So 
So if you could speak to like like when miracles, like I can see the miracles, you know, occurring here, but at a personal level, it's been it's been pretty rough. Yeah, I can talk about that. You know, there. There has to be something to focus on as as the darkness is moving through or as it's it's being released because without that it it becomes like it can be a preoccupation like the mind turns on itself in a very vicious way, almost like oh no, oh no, here we go again, oh no, this is what is this in, inescapable you know it it gets very dark, and Francis and I were just talking today. And we were just, this morning, we were so grateful for how we are drawn together for a purpose and we are given specific joining task. Uh, whether it's a movie or whether it's music or, or whether it's putting on a mystery school or whether it's doing a center. Um, but it just takes the willingness to be used in some way where you just take your skills and abilities and say, they haven't got me out of this. You know, I, the way I've used them have, have bound me and wound me in even tighter. And there must be a way that everything I've learned can be used to loosen and, and unwind me from this ego. Uh, and the spirit must know that way. We were just marveling at all the collaborations. I mean, I think back to... When Suzanne and Jeffrey came together, they were working on an app, a Spiri app. You know, there's there's Siri, and this was Spiri. It was in a house that we rented up from a friend of mine um, up there in um, was Monterey, Mexico. Yeah, it was to the north. And how that was the focus. There was all this stuff going on in the house, but they were focused on this app. Everybody was building an app. And that's why I think it's so important for us to be given guidance by the Spirit of something we can channel our energies into because we're going to have all this emotional stuff coming up anyway. If we don't have something that's, that's steady, keeping our attention, then it's, we can just fall back into all kinds of habits. It reminds me, too, of, um, of sometimes, you know, like with babies, their attention can be so scattered and then they have a rattle and then all of a sudden their eyes focus on the rattle. Uh, one time I saw a Mother Teresa documentary where she walks in and there's there's this baby that's in there and the baby is is shaking uncontrollably and is is just visibly very distraught and dis- distracted. And she just goes over and she, it was one of her uh, sisters that goes over and, and just makes eye contact and holds and caresses the baby. And you see the baby come into attention and the love, it just goes from all this shaking, this chaos into this, you love me, I feel it, you love me, that connection. So we're very big on using projects, collaborative projects, not for the sake of productivity, not for the sake of getting things done, not trying to save the world. You know, it's for our mind training. We, we use it in such a devotional way. And everything that comes to us, everywhere we go, every place where we join together, uh, holy encounters, properties that get used, maintenance, every nuance, internet, everything that we do is all has just the focus of mind training. But we don't just sit and close our eyes and, and hope that Jesus is going to clear our mind. We're, we're so willing to say, use it, use it all, whatever I perceive. And I feel like that's really the call of your heart. There's, there's a way where you can connect in and feel like you're part of something in a mind training sense. It's all really for the mind training. It's not for any other goal. But I think that's something we were just talking t- today for some time about how appreciative we are have been given this path to be shown that way. Because nothing, we can't even imagine. Years ago we could have never imagined anything that's unfolded. It, it certainly wasn't. We weren't trying to manifest it or or draw it up on vision boards or vision board or anything. We, we It's gone to the point where it looks like nothing we could have imagined, and yet we're just smiling and going, wow, thank God it was used the way it was used. 
And that's the key. Yeah, and I think also like we are very used to define our own problems and really wants to f- to 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 fix the problems as I define it and find love in a specific way. If I see that there is unrequited love and I really want the prayer to be answered in this particular way that you know the love interest will show some a reciprocity kind of interest back that would be the end result but the way that um, we realize and what David was talking about was really the healing happens in such a collaborative way even just you and Lynn came together and to 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 actually acknowledge okay we we don't we're so close to this pop things are falling apart, the self-concepts are falling apart, there's so much pain surfing to the uh, surface, and we need help. And you guys came together, and all of this is a collaboration. And this is healing whether you see it or not, because it really brings the, the spirit. And in the collaboration, a lot of things happen. Patterns come up and thoughts come up. And I think we, we we don't want to underestimate um, the the value of what is right in front of us, because we sometimes we think our problem is still existing, and yet the the answer is already right in front. So the collaboration offer is offered by the spirit and saying, "Why don't you use this to clear?" whatever um, fear that you have. And we realize, you know, when we come to community, we don't have to fix a lot of the issues we have with my mother, with my father, because my mother, mother, father right, lives right here. You know, it's all coming up anyways. You don't need to um, define the problem in a very specific way and try to solve it in the old context. But trusting, oh, wow, this is collaborating, happening and there are people here, what if I use it to the max? There are thoughts I'm scared to share. There are love I'm scared to share. What about I just really give myself over to this and see where it leads? And it's going to lead to something that's really beyond beyond it all. So... Hello. Yes. Um, I've been studying the Course in Miracles for several years, and uh, but I'm new to your work. And um, the intriguing aspect that I want to ask is: uh, we pray, we receive, and and then we act in the world. But can you describe that sense of um, prayer or surrender? I, th- I think it could be helpful here in terms of how how do we pray in such a way, how do we surrender in such a way that we really are open to the guidance that we long for? Yeah. There was, along with A Course in Miracles, um, the scribe working with uh, Ken Wapnick, they did ask Jesus to talk about prayer as a topic, and he dictated a whole pamphlet specifically called The Song of Prayer. So that was very impactful for me because we were talking about the specifics. He was explaining, you know, there can be a terror of the specifics. So you have to work, kind of work your way up the ladder. Uh, and the final prayer is, Father, what is your will for me? It's, it's, it, it doesn't have the specifics involved. It's just the light. You're, you're in the light. You're in the identity for joy, for happiness, for love knowing God's will for perfect happiness. Now, when you move up the ladder, what Jesus has been showing me was that when, whenever you play, pray for specifics, you're still praying from the level where you believe you are because you believe in specifics. And then you can't help but pray for specifics when you believe in them. 
even if it's just in your heart. It doesn't have to be like a, an overt prayer, a spoken prayer, but in your heart. And then he basically worked with Helen Shuckman in showing her that the more she could re remove the, the specific request and the parameters from the prayer, the more helpful the prayer would be. So the more it's tied down to specifics, the more limited the prayer is. It's really the desire of your heart. It's synonymous with the desire of your heart. And then when you can remove the, the specifics, um, it, it's even more valuable. It takes you faster to the light. Like, for example, Helen Shuckman, she, she wanted a certain kind of used Borgana coat in New York City. And she would only pay a certain amount of money <laughs> for a used Borgana coat. You see how specific the prayer was. And Jesus needed her to channel the course. So Jesus told her exactly where to go in New York City to get a used organic coat for this amount of money that she could pay. And then he would give her some instruction. He'd say, but it could have even been more helpful and more time-saving if you had just said, um, guide me to the coat for me. You see, if she took off the parameters of the Borgana and the price and everything like this, he could have handled that as well. Here's the best coat for you. I know you better than you know yourself, actually. So if you take the parameters of the prayer off, I can help you and it could save time for all of us. So that's pretty much the way it goes with, with prayer. You know, we, we have so much prayer, we have so much joining, so much communication that goes on in our community. And it starts to get the mind into to start to realize that that the guidance is there and to tune into it to be receptive to it will be a time saver uh, instead of going around and asking what do you think what do you think what do you think there can be times where like jeffrey and Susanna were saying where there that there was a thought of the relationship and then the thought came in of of a marriage and then the blessing or the confirmation just kind of moved it along uh, as a the confirmation helped, and that 's the way it goes for us, where we work on these projects and we stay so open and we really are communicating and putting th stuff out about it and then there 's that stillness and okay what really what 's given what would really be the most helpful thing and and patience too sometimes it takes a while for that that extra piece to to click in where everyone goes, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, of course. Where there's that recognition for it. So our community prays a lot because that's, that was my pathway. I just found that I, I needed to do that every step of the way. The early travels, I was not an experienced traveler. I didn't know how I'd be provided for. Where's the, okay, great, a three-cylinder car. Where's the gasoline going to come from. I don't have any organizational support. I have no church support. Uh, I'm just off there and I have limited resources and Jesus is like, no problem. He's like, I'll take care of everything. Places to sleep, you, food, everything. It was so miraculous. Every day out on the road with Jesus, it, it was such flooded with such care uh, and he's like saying, yeah, I can care for you better than <laughs> you can care for yourself. I know you think you can do a pretty good job with your education and all this. No. He says, I'll show you. I'll go before you and, and convince you that, that I will handle things. If you'll shine the light and you'll be a demonstration of love and you'll extend and let me extend through you, I will handle everything else. I had to be shown that. I mean, it, it would have sounded uh, kind of, well, maybe. It, it could be a good deal if it actually <laughs> happens, but I had to actually go out there and, and put myself in the, in the opportunity. And then as I did that, that's just been what I've been sharing for many, many years, actually decades. The ones that seem to be drawn toward that come with an expectation that they will pray and they will hear and they will be guided they have that expectation. I'm, I'm not saying from the word go, you will never hear the Holy Spirit. I'm saying, oh, it's inevitable you'll hear the Holy Spirit. Uh, and even if Jesus says in the Course, it's, 
It's rare for people to hear the voice for God directly. Rare doesn't stop anybody, you know. <laughs> There's seven million people on the planet. If, we're, if you're going to devote yourself to listen and follow, and you have that desire, that burning desire in your heart, then you just like draw forth the witnesses and the reflections. And I think that's the way it's gone in our community. People show up and they do pray and they do lead very devotional lives, I have to say. I used to tell people, I said, everyone is, they're, they're saints in training. I like calling people saints in training <laughs> because they first react to the word saint, like, <laughs> who are you talking to? <laughs> you know, they don't like the, the word saint. It's like, oh, that has too many expectations with it. I say, no, no, saints in training. You know, we're all working towards that purification, and we're all going to support each other, and we're all going to share what's working for us, and we're going to share our miracles, and it's going to increase and strengthen in our awareness. So that's how it works. And it's really just like Francis was, everyone we've all been sharing, we're, we're just drawn to something. We come, we feel an openness, and then we just take our baby steps toward that, whatever really resonates. And also I've asked people to, to just question things. You know, I mean, my friend Lisa, she came and she came and left and came and left, but she came... And she would be there living in the house with me and working, and she would look at me and she'd say, I'm watching you. I've got hawk eyes. I'm watching every move you make, every step you take. And I say, good, good, that's good. You know, you shall know them by their fruits. You do a, a bit of investigation. You know, now with the Internet, it's easy to, to investigate. Check it out. You know, I, I like the end of that movie, a uh, quantum movie called What the Bleep Do We Know with Fred Allen Wolf at the very end with his white hair. You know, he's, his hair's flying in the wind. He says, don't just take it from me. Try it out. Find out for yourself, he says, with his hair flying and blowing in the wind. And I'm like, I like that guy. Try it out for yourself. You know, so we're always encouraging people to dive in, try it out, and... And we are very transparent, and we do put we put so much on the internet. We're we're not only transparent; we just pour stuff out. So for people who feel drawn to music, we have a thing called Living Miracle Studio. We've got all these musicians that have come from around the world that really tune in. They pray. They hear the lyrics. I don't even know how many we've got, but and there's more coming. Netta's coming, and it's just we have a whole music ministry. We now have done our first film. <laughs> we have centers, mind training centers in Utah. We have mind training center in, on an island in the Mediterranean, in Europe, in Spain. We have mind training centers we've had down in Mexico where people come together and work on collaborative projects, pray together, talk, express, do whatever. These things have worked for us really well for years. And then we have people now that are like our friend Kirsten. She's, I think, in Holland or Belgium, I think Holland. They're out on the road shining, sharing, doing gatherings like we're doing in different parts of the world. Uh, and when we did this Holland retreat, there was about, we had about 180 of us that showed up at this castle in southern Holland. And it was the most amazing, miraculous time for a whole week. People took a week out of their lives and came there. And we had, what we have? The movie, we had movies, studio, studio music, we, we, all kinds of things happening there. It was like a revival. And, and a bunch of happy people, uh, including one who's coming and now drawing us to, to Sedona. I wish they would come to Sedona. And there you are. So, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's like a momentum of... of joy that grows stronger and it helps us build our trust in the, the spirit and it helps our prayer life too yeah well you answer already everything <laughs> 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 well i had the same uh, uh prayer actually for you guys to, to meet you guys i mean i've been in the online retreats but i never show my face 
but I just experience everything like a lot. Uh, and I guess what, what you just say right now is uh, exposed, right? Exposing the the the, uh, the practice that we had uh, with sharing uh, yesterday was it moved a lot. It just just for the first moment and uh, to be afraid, pretty much afraid of love, afraid of intimacy and uh, of God, right? Pretty much. Um, and, but now I hear uh, about relationships, and I've been thinking, what what is my purpose? I mean, what is? And I remember the prayer that I had a long time ago. It was, uh, "Use me for whatever you think." And that was the first time that I think I prayed specifically to Jesus uh, many years ago. And then, don't send me any other distractions. Don't send me anything. Uh, nothing. Just. Just use me whatever you want, however you think it's going to be better for me for everything to serve, right? Um, and then it, I forgot about it. And I was doing yoga, a lot of meditation, a lot of uh, books, reading. And then the second time I heard that it was, you need to get married from a yoga instructor, uh, uh, Kundalini Yoga. This lady, she's, I don't know, like you said, I trusted her, so I felt like a direct. Uh, instruction, okay, who, who am I going to get married with? And I, I don't know. And then this friend comes with my ex-wife, and then uh, I needed to get a visa, but I wasn't planning on getting a visa to come in here. I wasn't working, really. I was just giving classes, instruction, uh, yoga, yoga classes. I, I wasn't making any real money. Um, but then I go to get my visa, and I bring my certificate that I'm doing a yoga certificate, and, and they gave me the visa. So it was, okay. Uh, and so I came to Tucson uh, for whatever, but I, then I, I saw my, my, my future wife at the, at the moment. So then we started dating, and then so all the relationship was really hard, but it was in prayer. I mean, they're, they're Christian, so that's when I actually knew that it was Jesus that I was being, I was following. I was kind of hearing. Um, but we started going to church, and I, I, I got into really the Christian Christianity. Um, but I saw that it was a, it was a separation happening with with her specifically, and and her family was just giving us support. But it was it was it was it was it was rough. Um, a lot of healing came. <laughs> I, I, I saw it that way. Uh, but then we got separated before I got my my uh, my actually my immigration papers, and so I said, okay, so I guess that was it. Just come in here, heal some stuff, and then go back to whatever my plan was to go to Mexico and and be an instructor, uh, yoga instructor, and you know. Um, but then, uh, so I put I I I filed my papers like uh, we're separated, and this is so this is how it is, and. And I was kind of uh, uh, wishing that, okay, bring me back to what I know already. And then they gave me approval. And I, okay, all right, fine, I'm, I'm here, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, so I got, and at, at the same time, I got the, this job promotion that to make enough money to, on my own, to have my own place and everything. So, okay, so, okay, whatever. Um, so I just keep going, but I've been, since then, I've been like practicing the course and and everything. Feel you know, seeing guidance, but a lot of healing has been rough. Um, but then I said, okay, maybe that this is it. Uh, and then uh, I was, I quit my job, like a secure job. And then I said, okay, what's next? Uh, maybe I, I now I can come back. And then uh, they gave me this other job. Okay, okay, for for a little bit for this company that I felt. <laughs> It was uh, to get my citizenship, I mean, a really good company to, I say, eh, okay, we'll see. So then I, I applied again for my citizenship, and right away, boom, boom, boom. So they gave me my citizenship. So I said, okay, maybe that's it. Now I can go back to Mexico, <laughs> <laughs> maybe Chapala. I mean, I've been thinking of uh, maybe going there. I don't have to live here. Uh, I can not go anywhere. Um, and uh, and I had some stuff pending, and before I came here, praying that oh maybe it should be nice, or maybe I don't have to go that far. Uh, 
I, I got my last paper that I needed, my social security. But really quick, everything. So it's, so I guess my thing is that, uh, and I've been asking for a purpose. I mean, what's my purpose? I mean, I, I know I've been healing a lot, but, uh, and, uh, but down, so what is my, you know, the purpose of actually having this stuff fixed? Uh, and I guess I just, you know, want to follow guidance and then, and now you guys right away, is <laughs> right here, and and um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, kind of exposed and feel comfortable about saying it out loud. I'm afraid of this, but then I kind of see that there's a plan uh, and fixing, you know, fixes relationships to for that purpose because I I don't I don't feel any other purpose. It's for me. But I don't I don't. I don't feel anything oh. else. So. It's just so beautiful how you're just sharing it. Do you speak Spanish? Yeah. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus has been working with me for so many years on his Spanish ministry, and so we're all, we're all just praying, please send us people that are someone who's bilingual. And uh, this woman, um, we had an online retreat not too long ago, and, and I saw her on there, and she was down in Argentina. A marina on the online retreat and I was just like I was up in Camas I'm like is anybody else seeing this it's like we are desperate <laughs> for for those that are bilingual you know in the ministry because there's so much love and light to share but for those of us that don't speak Spanish there's like a huge call a huge need for that and so uh, yeah Marina she she did uh, she was in Australia then she everything sent her back over to Argentina. Now she's in Mexico, but she's such a big part. How many weeks ago did she come? And now she's like a... A couple of months. A couple months ago she came, and now she's like a huge part of the ministry. She's like right in the core of the ministry because the need for bilingual skills is so strong. And it is pretty obvious. I mean, the way the doors have opened for you uh, to be here in the United States, you know, we have many stories of people who have tried for years and years and years, it, and and in this particular climate right now, the way it's it's very miraculous the way that it's opened up. So I hear you saying, yeah, I'm paying attention. I'm like not invested, but okay, again and again and again, the doors just open and open and open. It's kind of like. I was traveling all over the world, and I was launching from this little, like a gingerbread house in, in Cincinnati, I call the Peace House, doing this global travels and ministry. And then we were there for a while, but then when we moved out to Utah, all the doors just opened. You know, things that we'd tried for years and years that wouldn't move at all. We went there, and it was like, bing, doors open and open and open. And we're like, okay, this is obvious that it's, there's such an ease with it and an effortlessness with it that we said, well, this is definitely uh, the Spirit's plan. We even had a, a place up there where we were looking at, was it was that last summer? When were we looking for a, a studio, a theater? We were looking at a theater maybe to rent a, a movie theater in the little town we up where we are in Camas. And then it was kind of moving in that direction, and all of a sudden Jeffrey sent out a message and said they can't get uh, internet, high-speed internet, to that theater. And so we went, well, that's not it. And then Jeffrey went walking around town having all these miraculous encounters. And before we know it, the doors just opened up for, you want to share about it, a studio came. We were like, oh, my God. The builders were J.C. and J.C. <laughs> that, was, that was the name of the builders. Yeah. And it just from his willingness, he just was wandering around the town, meeting people. There was even this woman on the planning commission that we had never had anything kind of come our way. And then uh, she was retiring, struck, uh, Je Jeffrey struck up a beautiful connection with her. And she's like, what do you need? Before I retire, I want to help you get it done and... And it just flowed and flowed and flowed. So that's a studio that we use for sharing a, a lot of shows now. But we, we really do, uh, yeah, the, we need those with a, with a heart of devotion to Jesus, to serve Jesus 
and who have bilingual skills, you know, it's like that's it's like at the top of our list. Tech skills, bilingual skills, you know, we're just like, wave them in there. I was like, that's Marina. Somebody talk to her. We, we need translators, you know. So thank you for sharing that because, you know, that that's... It's beautiful the way you shared it too, that how things are just unfolding and you don't really have a preference for the way that it needs to go. And it sounds like, you know, Mexico and the United States were both considerations for you, but but in your heart you just want to be happy, connected, uh, open to God. Um, even in terms of relationship, it's like the prayer is always if, if the relationship can be used for healing then bring it on. Uh, then the relationship won't be used by the ego as a distraction or a hiding place. So that's, that's just beautiful. I'm glad you shared. I've been, I've been pushing all those away. <laughs> like yeah. I can see how I push whatever it's... Uh, more money? No. More this? No. Uh, even kids and family, I, I don't feel drawn to it. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's in my way or anything, but I just don't feel it. I don't, I don't know, but... Definitely, I see the big picture so far, and it's okay. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm ready <laughs> to yeah. commit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you showed your face here, and if you're ever on our unlimited retreats, uh, no. put yeah, your no, camera on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll all go, there he is. <laughs> <That's> the... <laughs> yeah, well, I see a hand up at the back. We probably have time for one more question. Hello. Perfect. Hi there. Um, I have not read The Course in Miracles, so I'm lacking context, and I'm having a hard time understanding some of the things you're talking about. Um, I keep hearing that the world is an illusion and that there is only one mind. And what I'm trying to understand is why is this one mind creating this world? And uh, how much free will do we actually have then? Good question. Well, last question is the, the can opener. <laughs> she says, right, she says, I am here to ask one question. Okay. <laughs> you got to love the spirit's humor. <laughs> well, the, the one mind isn't creating this world. It's, it's the ego, which some, the Christians can call Satan, <laughs> or you could just call it an error if you wanted to keep it a little softer. <laughs> Satan sometimes is, uh, but it's an error. But it, it, a mind giving uh, that much power over to an error, which it's called a tiny mad idea, that in the Bible, for example, it describes the fall, you know, Adam and Eve and, and the, the snake and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is kind of a symbol of duality, um, good and evil. Basically, that's describing the fall. And in A Course in Miracles, it's just a mind-training device for a mind that believes in separation. So there's no uh, theoretical answer for why would love create disease or why would love create war or why would love create... Um, conflict. Uh, there is no theoretical answer. It's just a, a book that's come from Jesus saying, you believe in separation. In fact, the two, the woman who scribed it, took it down over seven years from Jesus dictating it, shorthand, and then her partner Bill typed it out. Um, at some point, they had taken down a number of um, chapters, and then at one point, they decided to ask Jesus your question, uh, which their version of it is, how could this happen in the first place if God is all love and all powerful, all knowing, all loving, all, all powerful, how could, how could this happen? And he said, well, it's a good question. He said, however, you should know by your daily experiences, your emotional ride like this, that you believe that it did happen. So you see how he's practical. He's like, well, you're asking a question. Remember, you asked for a better way because it was such a wild, chaotic life you've had. You believe it's happened. It hasn't happened in reality, but you do believe. It's like a, 
a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like a Pygmalion, you know. It's like what you believe you draw forth. Because you're so powerful, you have the power to draw forth what you believe. Not that it's truth. Like truth is love. But you believe that you're separate from that love. And you've fallen from that love. So I'm going to help you right where you believe you are. You ask for a better way? Here, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> you two prayed together and said there has to be a better way. And he's like, and I'm giving you the answer to your better way. Which is a, a wake-up tool. It's just a device a tool, a book to be used and practiced to forgive, to learn how to forgive. So that one mind is not creating this world because creation, he says, is purely spiritual. That God created Christ, not Jesus, but the Christ idea, pure love. And even Christ has creations. So you have spiritual creations that actually come from who you really are, but you're unaware of them because... You're asleep and dreaming. Believe you, you don't even know your own creations because you, you have dreamed up a world of time and space and specifics. And reality is not like that. So, in a short answer, the Course is basically saying creation is purely spiritual and what we would say this world of time and space is a projection of the ego belief. So the ego is a tiny mad idea. In the Bible, you know, some of us who were raised with Christianity, there was, there was Adam and Eve, there was a snake, there was a tree, and there was an apple. <laughs> you know, some of us know the story. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus said, God would never put you in such a position. Like, he would never put you in a place where you could actually truly fall. This is all of your own making, it's ego it has nothing to do with God. But I'm going to give you the step-by-step -step instructions to how to connect with the Holy Spirit and wake up from this dream. So it's a dream. You're dreaming a dream. And remember when we have nighttime dreams, we actually, when we're dreaming them, we think they're pretty real. You know, we're not usually questioning, am I dreaming this? We're usually reacting and responding and all emotional like we are all during our daily life. And he's saying, no, all your time is spent in dreaming. You're, what you do during your daily activities is a dream, and what you dream about at night is all getting generated from this ego. But he said, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. And he's, he's given us an instruction manual on how to pull our mind, our beautiful mind, away from this tiny mad idea. So in A Course in Miracles, he doesn't have the Adam and Eve story. This is his version. In The Course in Miracles, he says, Into eternity, where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. So you forgot to laugh at this idea. And that's, that's what this whole point is, is just to have a good laugh. In fact, on the way here today, Lynn is driving me here today, and we're looking out, and she says, see that house up on the hill? I looked over, there's this white house. She said, that's, that was Lu Lucille Ball's house. And I was just, oh, well, she was like legendary funny. Legendary funny. And, and now here we are ending our gathering here this weekend with, yeah, we have to remember to laugh. We have to learn to, to not take seriously either the ego or the world that the ego made to try to keep us trapped. Yeah. That is fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And it's been a blessing. And, and actually, uh, yeah, we're... We're going to be in town tomorrow a little bit, and then we fly out and go back to, uh, two of us go, Francis and I go back to Mexico, and, and Jeffrey and Susanna go to Utah. Then they're going to join us next weekend in Mexico City. So we're going down to do one of these in Mexico City uh, next weekend. So 
with Spanish translation. <laughs> we need that. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you for coming. You. It's been yeah, so very, very precious. Amen. Very, very precious. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us here.